It was the best of times and it was the worst of times for baseball in Oakland. Find out the full details on this week's episode of the Indy Bar Report podcast. Back again, episode number 265 of the Indie Bar Report podcast, the only show that is still waiting for those sweet, sweet yams to reappear. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, I respect that you really went for it. Yes, I did, because we have to understand Fetty Wap is truly a voice of, I would call it a generation, but really just those of us that were roughly 18 years old between the years of 2015 and 2016. Yeah, it didn't really last long enough to make it a whole generation thing, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's 100% right. And uh, in fairness, though, Trap Queen is still and will always be an absolute banger. Banger, dude. It's so good. It is. Uh, man. For real, for what, real. What, oh, God. An American poet. <laughs> ah, this is the best, worst podcast on any platform. Is that what we're aiming for? I mean, we already know you got the worst baseball Twitter, so I'm trying to get the worst baseball podcast. And we really could become a extremely easy to beat duo. I was gonna say formidable, but then I realized no, we want the opposite of formidable. And I didn't know if it was unformidable as a word or if it wasn't a word. So Aim it high here, huh? Yeah. Uh, this is this is on me for not committing to getting that minor in English. <laughs> yeah as long as you take the accountability i think that's a good thing exactly see it's all about accountability like shorts you tell us we need some accountability some accountability in here boys some accountability say? in here it can't be playing a period the night before and then expect to play three the next night no it can't not gonna happen can we, can we drag in the third dude or in our case you're gonna be dragging the first five minutes of the show this is not our finest work I really think uh, it is. Not our worst. <laughs> You're not wrong. You're really not wrong. Let's talk about the A's before we get off track here. Yeah, we're going to talk about Major League Baseball because the A's are leaving Oakland for good after the 2024 season. The Ballers will be the only game in town, which is good for the Pioneer League in Oakland. However, what's bad for the Pioneer League and I guess Yolo County is the fact that the A's are going to Sacramento and are going to play in a ballpark 40 minutes to what I believe is the east of UC Davis's campus. And said ballpark the A's will be playing in holds 14,000, and the A's are going to be there until the conclusion of the 2027 season. So, not great. With all, with all that said, it truly is both the best of times and the worst of times for California baseball in the sense of it's really good if you're the ballers. You, your competition just got leveled there. Mm-hmm. Although I suppose the counterweight to that would be if you assume Major League Baseball is the primary force in getting people interested or acquainted with the game on um, even just like the most basic level, losing that focus is going to hurt. And if we're going to say, well, the spike campaign is what they're kind of working off of, this both helps and hurts it at the same time I kind of view it. Mm-hmm. However, obviously the plus side is Anyone in Oakland that really wants to give the finger to the A's, it's probably going to go to the B's games. That's like their way of saying, hey, look, we support baseball. And obviously, you know, if you want to see professional baseball and you're in Oakland, your choices are either go across the bridge to see the Giants play, which I would assume you're not going to go across the bridge and watch a rival team play, or you're going to go to Raimundi Park and watch the Oakland Ballers. Now, of course, the true bad side of this is in the the case of YOLO where already you've had to deal some level with uh, the River Cats and now having a major league team in there probably isn't going to help the cause much either. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, it's not how I want to start in that conversation. There's just a lot. I think first we'll cover the positive. I think you know, I think Oakland's going to be hesitant to celebrate this because obviously, like, it is, you have to kind of mourn with your fans, your fan base, like the loss right, yeah. they are hurt over. Like, uh, so you can't be dancing on that. 
but we've already talked a lot about Oakland and what they need to succeed. And I think it's um, it, the number one thing is they needed days to leave. They needed, you know, no ownership changeover and then to stay in town. Cause then what are we really doing here? Um, yeah. I, I think that obviously happens here, but it, in addition to that now, I mean, it's happening. It's, it's becoming there real. is no going to the games to try to keep the team. You can go there to speak about how, like, to, to make it clear how you feel that you're not happy about it if you're going to an A's game, but you can't, you're not going to, like, you know, to, to convince them in a way to stay or some last hope. It, it's now officially like you can move on, like, it, they can move on freely to a new team, especially one that is in its existence kind of a middle finger. You know, and we've talked about how that's sort of a spite brand currently, yeah. which I don't like long term. Neither of us uh, think it's yeah. the long term play, but I think for this year it would certainly work. So it's, I just think it, it works really well for the exact position that they're in. I, yeah, I mean, that's about the long and short of it, if I'm honest, but I, I am curious about a couple things here. I don't know there's been talk and like, you know, it's been nothing solid, but it has been mentioned enough times where I think it's at least notable that mm-hmm. the, like the Coliseum would be an option for this ballers team. And now that it's open, a lot of people are like, Oh, you know, maybe I don't, I just, I, don't I can't, I can't emphasize how bad an idea that is. I'm like horrified yeah. every time I even hear it in like a group chat or whatever. Like, yeah, so I'm nervous here. Okay, I'll say this. Is it. So it's a positive across the board for Oakland because it just yeah. opens up the fan base. It, it cuts any real long-term potential of ties between fans, baseball fans in that town and the major league competition, and it directly positions you as the second option. The My own angst and nervousness is something we've also talked about, which is I have very limited trust in this Oakland ownership, uh, the ballers ownership, that is. And their leadership. Well, technically and also, I, yeah. yeah well, and now I'm like, okay, like, you need to not drop the ball now. Like, it was like, okay, it's going to be a slow play, kind of increasing to, like, the moment of truth of, like, who, like, who's showing up after this? Like, how are you going to get these fans? What are you? And it just, it does bump that butt, that deadline a little bit in my head. And maybe that's not the reality of it. But I'm like, there's decisions to be made now. Like, it's official what's going on with the A's. Now it's going on with the B's. Uh, and I, I have a little bit of anxiety <laughs> that they're going to brutally mishandle this. Um, yeah, like here's the thing. I just want to touch the Coliseum bit. Yeah, I because I, I really I, feel strongly about that. Yeah, I, I think playing like as a full time or even like a half and half deal is a very bad idea. It's just too big. It's too big for a major league team. Let's be clear. Clear on that. It's out of date. It's broken down. It is to just come right out and say it with zero tack or decorum, a piece of shit stadium. That's what it is at this point. It's just too worn down. And I have extreme doubts about either local government or a private group coming in and improving it. It makes no sense to try to just renovate properly it. maintaining it whatsoever. Like that's also yeah. gonna be such an expensive undertaking. Oh yeah. And there's no way you're going to generate enough revenue to justify that. There's just no exactly. way you're going to do that. Now, that being said, if someone else, like say the city was, you know, keeping it in working shape, I think there's an agreement with a different entity, maybe a sports group to use the venue for something, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. If you keep it in decent baseball shape, I wouldn't be opposed to playing like, say, a Coliseum Classic, like once a year or something there, like maybe one series there a year. I wouldn't be against that. I think maybe you could go ahead and do something with it tack on some nostalgia of going there and really make it a, a true celebration type weekend and you do it say middle of July every year something like that you know right when you start eh, middle end of July right when we're getting into that dog days period of the season where baseball isn't really on the forefront of your mind and you're looking for something else to do that could be a great idea I wouldn't be against that per se I think there's obviously a lot of logistical hurdles you have to clear in that case but for a one weekend thing similar to what we saw a couple months back when they tried to rent the Coliseum and that went nowhere. Something like that, I don't hate, but I really do despise the idea mm. of going to a stadium that was so bad, it was a non-insignificant factor in costing you 
both a major league baseball team and a national football league team. I really hate the idea of putting a pioneer league team and no disrespect to the pioneer league, but we got to understand where they're at and what their fan base is looking like. And the general average attendance you're going to draw from any pioneer league team, even if you're drawing like, let's say an astronomically high amount for the pioneer league, like say eight, 9,000 a game on average, Mm -hmm. that's still cavernous in that building. And it's just such a bad idea on a lot of levels. So I'm not sure how serious of an idea that is, but I I would really warn against it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just don't know why you would invite... Um, You're inviting problems. Invite, invite the opportunity for bad optics. You are a position of the good guy. Nobody is saying you should go to the Coliseum. That is an insecurity thing talking. That is... Frankly, it sounds like having the weird former super fans of the A's run the team being like, oh, I, I want to have my team in the Coliseum. Like, it's not your childhood. It's not. Um, it's a business. And optically, it's not great for the organization, honestly. And it, it wouldn't, I don't believe it would be great. What do I know? But it just seems like, hell, we know Indy Ball pretty well, man. And it just seems like it would be opening up for some bad situations. I don't, I I just, you are your own thing. Define yourself as your own brand and not as simply not the ace. That's crazy to do. Nobody in their right mind would suggest that be a good idea. Um, It it just worries me that they continue to seem to steer that way toward like, well then we'll play in the Coliseum. It's like, no one's asking you to do that. Have a nice ballpark in, Hey, don't try to go roundabout and not do your own ballpark either stay and really make Ramondi a thing or build your own ballpark or uh oh is the town not going to give you a ballpark because j- once again they are not willing to commit to a professional sports team and now you're not willing to pay for one well then maybe then you we back should our- shut your mouth about the A's because you are the A's yeah that and sorry that was it, aggressive well, I mean it's spot on I mean the whole not the A's brand Again, like we've talked a lot about the spike campaign. There's been some pushback about, oh no, they're not trying to be spiteful. They're just trying to embrace Oakland. I get that, but there's there is an element of spite in there. No matter how much people want to say or, or not say it's there, there is an element there. When you start to go too heavy into it and start to do things that the A's were doing that they're no longer doing, mm-hmm. now it seems like an impersonation. Yeah, I was gonna say it seems like a bit of an inferiority complex coming out. Ooh, there you go. Because it feels like you got to take what they were doing and be like, see, we could do it. We're doing it too. And it's like, no one asked you to do it. And there's a reason why they're not doing it. Like, yeah, we did not ask for this. That, like some of the ace decisions are justified. A lot of them aren't. But you can kind of deduce what is and isn't if you just take a critical look at it. And it's just, I also do wonder too a little bit, if you have people go to the Coliseum and be there, at a certain point, what's the atmosphere going to be like? Because I could see it being either getting a little out of hand, which creates a whole new set of issues, or I could just see it being a very cavernous environment that doesn't do well for getting the crowd engaged and optically kind of tricks the brain of being like, no one's really here. And you could have That's seven, 8,000 yeah. people there and be drawing phenomenally that in a ballpark that seats like, say, regularly 7,500 to 1,000, have it be a really electric atmosphere, but in a ballpark that seats, what, 50 plus thousand, being at a 20% capacity makes it feel like, God, everyone's so spaced out and not really here. Even if you close off, you know, like 60 plus percent of the seating, which you'd have to do. Right. It's still like, I feel like it invites problems too, especially because you're going to get people that are going to get bored and not want to be watching the game. And instead are going to take this as an opportunity to say, Hey, let's explore the Coliseum. Mm -hmm. And then you're asking for either players just trip down memory lane, like not even needing to be like something that's like, Oh, just wandering about looking. It's just, you know, you're like, Oh, let's see what it looks like. You're asking for a fan to either go into a space they shouldn't be and get hurt or go into a space they shouldn't be and cause a problem. And now you really, really have a major issue. 
So I, I may have been too much on talking about playing in the Coliseum for what it is, but man, but we like just the, really want to express the fact that please do not do that. Like, yeah, like the more and more a big opportunity here, you've been gifted something by the universe that they decided to make this announcement so early, which is crazy, by the way. They, I would have kept this on the download as long as possible. If oh, I was God, yeah, because like, now you're going to have another like near I six mean, months of baseball their, dealing with this. Yeah. I know, and it is like, I mean, they're not going to lose that much money because they're not making much money anyway, so yeah. whatever. They're eating every game, essentially, but um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, opportunity, by the way, for maybe the real one that I'm curious. Well, I guess they're in the Pioneer League, so it's Flow Sports. So I was going to say, I'm interested to see if they could find a TV deal for themselves out there if they position themselves so aggressively. But Well, there's other Flow Sports... Uh based teams that do get TV deals where they can go over mm. the air. That's right. That's right. I remember that now. So they could probably get some OTA contracts. Mm. Yeah. That'd be interesting. I mean, but I, I want them to focus on things like that and not just what uh, be okay with being the ballers, dude. Like, it's okay. That's yeah. cool. It seems like you got some traction, man. Yeah. yeah. Like, I don't even mean to say this in a offensive way, but there's no way the phrase I'm about to use isn't going to be taken as like kind of <laughs> offensive. That's clearly my specialty the more and more I get down to it, which is you got to understand your place in the game right now. You're a first year pioneer league team. You have a lot going for you and you have certain advantages in being that that enable you to take strategic risks that could really pay off. Do that instead. Don't try to pretend that you're on the level of a major league team. Don't try to pretend you're even on the level of, say, a triple-A team. You are an partner league. Ugh, gag me Rose. using that term. But you're a partner league team in the Pioneer League in what's undoubtedly their largest market and the market that's gotten the most fanfare and probably out of any expansion market we've seen across the board in independent league baseball over, mm-hmm. I'd say probably the last 10 years. Oh, yeah. Has the most, has the best opportunity of really being a success because you have a group of people that want to accept you or feel scorned by the way the whole A's thing went down. So you really can fill a niche. Mm-hmm. But don't try to wear size 10s when you're only a size 8. And it's not even that. I think of it from this perspective, it's so hard to successfully start an indie ball organization and brand. There's so many things coming against you. There's so many expenses and, and issues of time and um, availability of resources. Like it's so difficult. The task list is so long and it's so daunting and it takes, it just takes a lot. And it, I look at it like you're being gifted a lot. The right, the I mean, the huge thing is just making sure people know you exist and what that indie ball is a thing. And a lot of that's been done for them. A, a lot the of that is a huge search. challenge. So, and what, and that's a huge opportunity to be able to take that off your plate and just focus. And I, I, I cannot. I cannot fathom being an organization at this point with or without those benefits that they're currently looking at and putting any resource into anything that isn't simply, you know, uh, for growing the strength of this thing long-term and doing everything you can to kick this thing off. Right. As opposed to being like considering this like weird game of chicken, like oh, yeah. spectacle should I, not I, be I, on I, the I table right doing. now. I get what they're doing. I understand that that is their strategy. I just don't agree with the strategy, really. Like, I don't agree with leaning on it so hard. Like, I get there's going to be a component of it that's spiteful, but it's like, um, it, because it just makes sense. But the number one thing, I think it speaks just as loudly if you were just proudly in Oakland doing your thing, not subtweeting and retweeting with like snarky remarks of the Oakland A stuff. Push them aside, be your own thing. And be loud about what you are and not about what you aren't. Like, do that. And I, it's just, I worry. I worry you know, a lot. I almost it's, wonder if this it would be better. A, a, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, for like the kind of snarkiness, I almost wonder 
if you would have been better off making it just one theme day and going all in on that one theme day and maybe making some merchandise about it, you know, some t-shirts and things like that. So that way you still do have that element to it, but it's not like omnipresent, right? Now, obviously that's minimizing the element a lot and maybe you're missing out on some opportunity to capitalize on it, but I feel like there's a way that you could do it more tactfully, you know, more velvet glove approach to it mm-hmm. than the way they're going about now and still get that one like really over the top weekend where you're like, hey, look at these guys. Like, I know they're screwing you over. Yeah, and I'm just, I'm not trying to be, so I'm not trying to really be negative about it. It's just, I mean, literally, I I do believe in this baller's situation. I, I, I believe in them without, you know, the constant seemingly like comparison and commentary regarding the A's. I, that's really what it is. And, and it frustrates me sometimes. Just, I'm like, just be you. Just be you. You'll be, f- I really do believe that they could be fine. Um, and I've expressed all my concerns previously, so I'm not going to rehash every single one of them. I think, you know, I am, I like it. Sorry. In my head, I'm also like, yeah, you have some benefits here, but you also don't have a ballpark, dude. Like focus. Oh, there's uh, a lot. That's, that's the, the other thing I noticed that, a little bit. Like, just, just hack away at the stuff that's in your bubble, dude. And then let it, let the, you know, what speaks louder than anything else, like anti A's or whatever, what speaks louder is if they can successfully make this ballpark work or they do announce plans to build a damn ballpark with it, not the city's money. And they are like, cause we're that committed. We'll be here. And, and with no commitment from you, with no commitment of your tax money, with no commitment of the money that, or, or uh, no commitment that you will be here in five years, we'll be here in five years. Like that speaks louder than just being mm. like, yeah, they're going to Sacramento. Like we're going to take the ballpark. We're like, yeah, like that- we have, we have re- we have replies on our tweets. Like, all right, cool. Yeah. And there's also a lot oh, of people that are negative, are- but it's not meant to be. I'm sorry. It's, yeah. it is genuinely enthusiasm and hope for this team. And a I know it's just a lot. Yeah, I just there's just a lot of defensiveness to around it, right? Like I saw some people that were posting like a picture of like this is where the ball is going to play, and they showed like the Google Maps version of Raymundi, and mm-hmm. people were like, "That's a two year old photo. That's not accurate to date." And it's like, yeah, but the general point still remains, right? Like, yeah, you are in a park. It, yeah, like it, it was a city park though. All right, yeah, and you it, still got to do a lot of work around it, and you got to like we when you announced this, we went through all the issues there. And like, yeah, it fits, you know, like whatever the internal timeline is, I guess. But like, I'm just saying, like, maybe we don't change where we're going to be playing our home games after Mm -hmm. right, you know, announcing it during the whole big press conference and everything like that. And people that only saw the big press conference were like, okay, Laney College. And then you got an audible quickly be like, no, 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 no. Go to Ramundi, go to Ramundi, go to Ramundi. And like it, it starts to get confusing after a while, and maybe we don't worry about what the huge end goal timeline is in the first three years, right? Maybe we focus for the first three years in building a solid, sustainable fan base that's willing to come out and show their support both in their presence and financially speaking, and through word of mouth in the community. And after three years, we have a good base there. And we look like we're on track to turn a profit in the near future, if not already. Then we start to think about, okay, well, what can we do to expand things, right? Because realistically, I don't so much care how opening weekend goes, you know, good or bad. I kind of assume it'll go good. I assume it'll draw well, you know, that first weekend. There's going to be a lot of hype around it, whatnot, but I'm not going to put a lot of stock in one weekend there. I start to care about when we get to like, July 27th, when we start to get to like August 17th, you know, stuff like that. It's like, okay, we got weekend games and midweek games when it's hot out and the summer's starting to wind down and there's been a lot of baseball already played. Can we still draw in, you know, a few thousand people a night then? Can we start to keep having good crowds and do good numbers, not just by a ticket sale, but merchandising and concessions and and all the other additional revenue sources. Are we still going to have positive feedback, both 
online and in real life at that point? Are we still going to be getting, you know, articles written about us in local papers and things like that? Are we still going to have that same kind of buzz when we get to the dog days of the season as we're going to have, you know, that first opening weekend in May? And I think that really should be the priority and not worrying about like, oh, well, we won't be able to expand from this site because there's a lot more red tape we got to go through if we want to do all this work. And it's like, unless it's absolutely necessary for year one, don't worry about that. Yeah, It's just not important. Focus on the things you can control and creating a, quite frankly, fun and enjoyable environment. Well, it's also like, I'm trying to think of the way to phrase this. Again, it sounds very negative, but really it's just like passionately like believing in and wanting this Oakland thing to work and really being concerned that they seem distracted. Uh, my my thought process, it, going back to the thing you said, because I've seen that too, like, oh, this is where, you know, the ballers are playing. The response to that isn't defensive. The response to that is, yep, yeah, you're right. That's an area of this uh, community, like uh, an old area of this community that we really love and we really want to help it out. And we think we're doing a good thing there and they, they're they helping us out. And we're helping them out, uh, you know, as a community together, which shines a light on when things got bad, the A's left and the ballers showed up and went somewhere where things have already been bad and they want to be a part of the solution. There you have your comparison. Criticism like, is an opportunity to make a customer. Yes. Someone cares enough to say something to look up where you're playing. Exactly. You might just buy a ticket. Exactly. That's where we're playing. We're hoping to really revitalize that part of the city. Why don't you come out and see what we can do? Yeah, that that is where we're playing. Come on out. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing you there. This opening day. Yeah, honestly, that's what I do. I would have responded with a link to uh, buy single game tickets and go, why don't you come out and see what we could do? Let's see if we can't make a fan out of you. Yeah, man. That I would just send them the tickets. It's fine. Well, we know your policy on tickets is just get rid of them, get them in the ballpark. Yeah, which, that's right. In fairness, I agree with that. It's just new teams, especially team. more than anyone. Oh well, yeah. Um, yeah. My other. It could only theory. cost fifteen dollars, but a t-shirt costs twenty-five. If they buy a t-shirt, you just offset it. Yeah, you're good. So, um, um, every team knows their own walk-in number. They they know what everyone spends when they get in the door. I'd love to see rank a rating of that. Though. That's, yeah. that's a conversation. Those are some back channeling conversations. I'm still only halfway through, but I'm always working for it. We'll see. The plus minus value per ticket sale. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, or just per, like I how much everybody page. who walks in the door, yeah, what are they spending? That's a fascinating number. Man. And yeah. It's the what's biggest the, one. Like, what's for the success. average patron worth? That's the question. Literally, I mean, that as somebody who's working community affairs, it's a number you keep on you. So when somebody says, why are we giving away some more tickets? Be like, because this is how much they're spending and zero is what they would have spent if we didn't give them free tickets. Yes. You got your choice. You can have zero dollars. You can have plus three. What's your call? Sure. Yeah, that, sure. That tracks. I mean, that, Hey, three is a larger number than zero. You're not wrong. Very good. My, very good. That's, Nick. The, that's cause I got a book on analytics now. Oh my. You okay. It's hockey analytics, not baseball. Don't I mean, sure. It's fine. Analytics. They're analytics very, something. Hockey analytics are very new, so I can get it on the ground floor and like try to understand what the hell FX and Fenwick means. That's right. You got all sorts of weird stuff going on over there, don't you? Yes, it's a, it's a. It's, I was gonna, I was torn between saying a zoo and a disaster zone here. It's really something else. Uh, speaking of uh, potential disaster zone. What are we thinking about this situation a little bit further north now? Because all of a sudden, YOLO went from Ooh. you have the AAA team 40 minutes away, but they're not really our competition. We're two different things. We got our own thing going on. And realistically, who's going to drive 40 minutes to watch minor league baseball anyway? That's not a sicko like us. So mm -hmm. you really weren't fighting for them. But now that there's a major league team that's 40 minutes away, that's a different situation entirely. Yeah, dude. Boy, does that look bad now? Um, and yeah. easy to be reactive. Um, yeah, easy to say it's going to be an issue. I mean, they might have a contingency plan for this, but I mean, I, it's hard to believe they would. I mean, let's be honest. They were talking about will just when will the A's go to Vegas? You know, when they start playing the AAA park. Um, this is this is bad. Yeah, I would yeah. look. I don't know. I haven't. You know, I don't know what the front office is thinking right now. But you have to be thinking. Uh oh, I. I don't. 
I would say it's under 50 50 that they put that this team is still in Sacramento next year. It doesn't make any sense. Or in YOLO next year. I just, doesn't make sense. I know that's, you know, they're, they're making it, it's not a one year thing, but like, I'm sorry, this is a brand that exists as the secondary team to keep the Oakland team company out West, essentially. And it doesn't mean, you know, they're an afterthought, but it does mean they were, they picked Oakland because they wanted a team in Oakland. They picked Yolo County because it was near Oakland. Yeah. Like there's other options. I hate to say it. Yeah. I mean, I would counter uh, with a couple of things though. And I may be over exaggerating some of them, but one, you could look at the major league team going there as two things. One, you could say, all right, well, there's probably a decent amount of A's fans in that general area. And they're probably equally as disgusted by, you know, what's happening as some of the fans by the Bay. I imagine that disgust is kind of like the epicenter of a bomb. You know, like if you're right where it impacted, you're probably a little bit more strongly impacted by the decision than if you are 50 miles out of it. But you're still probably not thrilled by it. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is perhaps having a major league team there Pricing may still not be, you know, minor league pricing, even though you're playing in a triple A ballpark. So if you could use somehow the A's being there for a couple of years to drum up interest in the sport and you offer yourself as the, hey, you don't have to drive 40 minutes in California traffic to go to watch the A's that are going to be putting on a complete just garbage product and pay major league prices to sit in a minor league ballpark, you instead could go out here, watch guys that are trying just as hard, that are admittedly younger and on a different level and skill than a major leaguer is. Obviously, not going to you know, get around that fact. But we're offering minor league pricing, a better family environment, and you could pitch it and all that. Maybe you could jump up interest from that. And the only other point that I could kind of, or at least that immediately comes to mind, on the this could not actually be that bad is keep in mind their gm used to work for sacramento the river cats so he probably has a detailed working of that whole situation at least from the triple a perspective and on some level i guess the more corporate end of it so that may help you in trying to counter this right you have probably one of the few people that are somewhat well equipped to counter it now, granted, I think I'm spotting them some points on that third point, but still, there's a lot worse people that could be handling the situation. I mean, yes, I agree. I just don't see how this... I mean, you are already the second team in town. I know that... And it's not about being 45 minutes away from the AAA park. It's about being 22 minutes away because you fight for middle ground. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. That's what I always point out with the Beck to the Frederick uh, Hagerstown conflict uh, in the Atlantic League. What I said, like, it's not about how far they are away. It's cut that in half because, like, you could reasonably reach out 45 minutes to people. I mean, hell, I go to Lancaster games. They're an hour from me. I go to, other than the Reading Phillies, I mean, I'm every team I go to, the four, five most frequent teams I go to are about an hour from me. So, but you're also I a sicko for this too, so you know. I am, but I mean, I talk to people all the time. Like, it's not a non-baseball fans will still go out to you like a wedding game people? from Philly-ish. So, not Philly-ish, but like King of Prussia for those in the local know in Southeast PA, which is, I mean, that's going to be a, a 45 to an hour. So, it's comparable. I, I'm just saying the point is, but cut that in half, really, because now instead of reaching out there, and that is, <sighs> I'm not going to get in the weeds on. It's a diameter issue as well because, like, the further out you go, the wider. If you cut out the outside part of your circle, that's actually a lot of people because the circle is wider. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Point is, it's Geometry a lot of truth, Ryan. Some of you followed me there. I get that. That's not the point. We're not going to get into it right now. It, it's just instead now all that middle ground, all those people in between. Instead of being like, "Hey, come see us," instead of the AAA team only, it's come see us. So the AAA team and MLB team. And now let's also consider MLB team is going to have a price point that's pretty aggressive, I assume. Yeah. Because, I mean, I remember what Toronto tickets were going for in Buffalo. 
uh, when they had played there during COVID. It was kind of wild. Um, and also, there's a spectacle of it, too. I mean, the same thing as Arizona yeah. and Mullet. Yes, exactly. I'm sorry. That was more what I was thinking, actually, because yeah. I remember uh, they only had crowd for maybe a few games in that Buffalo-Toronto situation, so that kind of inflated pricing, too. But you're right. That, that's a good example. So that is, you know, there are going to be people who are not priced out, but a lot of them are still just going to go to the AAA game there. So it and it, you got to figure there's maybe going to be some improved amenities down there too. So it's it's such a tough situation, man. I'm trying to think of what the way is around this. Uh, I I don't know really <laughs> what exactly the move is. It, I. Th- uh, <laughs> I, I hate I'm looking for my positive on this like my positive is I think Oakland's probably far more likely to thrive now I'm yeah but the counter is they don't have that other partner now for travel well my suggestion is you can have a partner I mean how far are they away from each other right now are they I think it's like an hour and change uh, yeah right um, where are they at UC Davis yep, I'll UC do the Davis. Google I'll, I'll do the Google Maps and UC Davis to Oakland, California is an hour and three minutes. Hour and three? Yeah, but that's right, as of I mean, right now. So that's like n- nearly 10 o'clock at night local. Yeah. Let's see. Mm-hmm. Assume what time would we say most trip. games are starting? Like, let's say you want to get there for a game at, what, six o'clock? Sound about right? Sure. Uh, that's anywhere from an hour and five to two hours with traffic and all that. That's not too bad. Yeah. Um, really your problem is once you get like down by like Berkeley area. So right when you're starting to get towards the city proper, it just jams up. I mean, my thought, my, what would I suggest? Great question. Uh, the Monterey Amber Jacks are no longer playing at the uh, ballpark in Monterey that they're at. Um, jogging my own memory here, trying to think of what that's called again. But um, it, it's, uh, in my opinion, it's a, a cool looking ballpark. I don't know exactly uh, how nice it is in there, but it's already standing. Yeah. It can hold about 2,000 people if my numbers are correct. It Here's- is. Can I stop you for a second on it? Because I'm looking at Monterey, California. And that is at best two hours away. It's probably close to three and a half hours away with, you know, traffic at that time of day. I don't know about all that. And then you got to, you still got to go through, you got to go through San Jose. You got to go through Fremont just then to get to Oakland. You still have a large chunk here. Like I'm looking at this map and like the estimated traffic. But I'm saying if you want a California team, I'm just saying. I, I would say like it's, a better option would be like if you could find something in Vallejo. What's their ballpark look like these days? I can look that up. Yeah, because I mean like that's at least a bit closer. My thing is I've always had a soft spot for that ballpark in Monterey. It looks cool. Oh, well, fair enough, but still it's you know just an, an say it's take challenge. the ride to Vallejo. Because Vallejo is only looking at thirty to sixty minutes, so it's about an hour. Coward should put a team in San Quentin. Sure. San Quentin jailbirds await. Just saying. Um, I don't think Not mean, a good situation. I assume we're looking at we want a ballpark that stands uh, that's already there. Yes, um, yes, that would have to be a prereq. Yeah, I mean, let me just double check what we got here. Yeah. I love the me- the complete mixed bag of Pecos Lake parks. It's so funny. Oh god, you never need some DLC. Let's see. see. This uh oh, I mean mm, not good. Too rough? No, it's it's rough. I mean it's rough. Okay, like I'm trying to think like who has a college in the area that you could bum off of. Yeah. That's probably your best bet, if we're being honest. Which I hate the fact we're talking about the possibility of a team dying before they even throw their first pitch. Especially when we I just know, have the it's manager super on negative. A Sorry, ago. everybody. But I'm also like... For all you well, YOLO yeah. stands, remember, I'm not the one that, that talked about you dying. I just said that as a challenge. 
Um, Out of curiosity, do you think UC Berkeley would be down to let them use their ballpark? I don't know. See, that one's like, I know, another hour north, though. Berkeley's not that bad. Okay, yeah, actually, Berkeley would be, if they could make it happen, would be perfect. Because it's anywhere from 15 to 40 minutes. It's only five miles away. I've come to really like and be impressed by the crew that seems to be running Marysville in the Pecos. Marysville okay. Drake seems to have it together. And let me double check one thing. Yeah, I mean, it is an hour north of where they already are set up with Sacramento. But I mean, like, you could make it work. But then are you better off going just Monterey at that point? That's about the same distance anyway. Right. Now, Monterey is not currently in the Pecos, which is kind of why I thought of it. Uh-huh. Um, but Marysville is doing some weird stuff too this year. So I'm, I'm interested in what they got going on. But yeah. the point is, I they have a cool ballpark so in Yuba City. Shout out. You could probably name the team the Yuba City Nine. I'm kidding. They won't let you do that because it's offensive, but like, it would kind of be a wild. It would be a wild move, boys. Call them the Yuba City Nine. Uh, Offense went missing anyway. Um, but yeah, man, I don't know. You could probably do something cool with that. Could probably solve the Uba City 5 case. Do that. Can we make this a true crime podcast? Just feeling it. Oh, God. Our demographics are about to shift heavily. I don't know. People, if you're an indie ball person, you like a deep dive. So, might not shift that much. Uh, yeah, you like getting right, real in the weeds on something <laughs> back on track here because we do actually have other stuff besides, you know, yeah, sorry, pioneer we're, we're, teams we have so much more. You know, we suck. Yeah. What I guess the general point would be Oakland probably improves in the situation as long as they hold true on their branding, they follow your Disney like advice of be yourself and it will flourish. And from there, you look north, and in Yolo's case, it's you're going to fight like hell because if you don't, um, you might not be around for as long as you'd hope because you're fighting a AAA team and a major league team now, and it doesn't look like it's going to get better for a long time. And Having to weather the storm for three of your first four years is a tall ask. Now, I'll put this out as a counter, by the way, uh, before we move on. Okay. Yeah, because I, I understand that was an extremely negative thing because even our, po- our positive was Oakland. I was negative about Oakland. That's on me. But it's just <laughs> my own private anxieties about the front office. Um, That's a guy between therapists. And then Oakland, shut up. Oakland. Yeah, mm-hmm. good call, actually. But... Yeah. Uh, Oakland <laughs> it's the most scene I've felt in a while. Uh, sorry, not Oakland, YOLO. They, uh, I mean, that is the one that I think we're legit to could be concerned about, but that could all be for nothing because I'll say this. Those of you who know me know that I have not played baseball in a long time. It should really? have been an even longer time, but I had the special talent of throwing a bunch of pitches in a game that did not matter. And it was long gone. And, you know, baseball is the perfect sport for the, we, it doesn't matter how successful you are. The success isn't existing out there on the ball field. We call that a placeholder. And, and I don't even think it is necessarily. It's just a placeholder insinuates, you know, something incoming, you know, a hundred percent. I, I mean, I could see this team literally just eating it for a while if Oakland is hopefully has the hope of being successful. And then if Oakland is successful, considering it's the same ownership group and it's the same, you know, and the league is certainly involved. I could see them just from the jump being okay. We talked about this day one from the jump being okay with this team just eating it financially because it's not about that. So maybe this is for nothing. Maybe we're way too, we're either way, way too early looking at ballparks. That's my own bias. And when Philip Monterey ballpark, I think Marysville is kind of cool. Um, but I like how the it, silver lining has so far been, look, you may be so insignificant to the grand scheme of things. You have nothing to worry about. 
dude, you can fail and no one cares. Um, honestly, that's all you I can be the child left. If I was told that younger, I think I would have actually been okay. <laughs> um, anyway, what was I between therapists about? Um, uh, I just, I, that's, I mean, that sounds, it just sounds so negative. I know that's a tough one, man. If, if you were the mastermind behind working success and angling success for you, though, you're just like, huh? There was always a, the, the path to success in that game is narrow and it just got much more narrow. If you listen carefully, you can hear a stampede of high wheeled bicycles coming to the DMs. Bring, bring. Tally Hogan, sir. We need to go mm. back to Oakland for a moment because they have additions to their coaching staff that we have to discuss. Yes, go for it. They have added two coaches to their staff. Jim Dedrick will be the pitching coach. Uh, Daryl D. Brown will be the bullpen coach. In the case of Dedrick, he is an 11-year veteran of pitching, parts of six organizations, including some major league service time with the Baltimore Orioles, 20 years in the game between scouting and coaching. Uh, In the case of Brown, Twice drafted out of Laney College, former home of the Oakland Ballers, might I add. And <laughs> he had a 10-year-long playing career between the Cubs and the Braves. And he is 17 years into a career as a scout across several organizations, I should say. So, Dedrick and Brown add to the staff. They're going to be working with pitchers. Hmm. Um, I mean, not a ton of thoughts, but, you know good i mean like, like guys with guys that with applicable applicable experience and i think that was the main thing that's that's the main thing you want to see going in a situation like this and people who might know some like know other people and you know can bring them in and that's it yeah i mean i agree with all that i think they probably between the scouting thing it really helps with the player procurement especially being that you have manager there that you know is more of a name in the sense of casual baseball fans will know as opposed to, you know, with the four major league experience there, as opposed to being part of an indie ball grind, having a guy that's, you know, been a scout for between the two of them about 40 years, that helps a whole hell of a lot. I will say, and I will ask though, because you're the guy that has a Roman province from memory, like memory. Oh God. Yeah. That's a poll. Any case, uh, did they ever announce like the rest of this staff or am I crazy? Cause I feel like they announced like a full staff in the past and now we're getting the second part of it. Um, or was it just like a hitting in a bench coach and dish to the manager? I thought that might've been it. Okay. I, I wasn't um, sure. So I figured I'd ask. Dig back in memory again. I think I do feel like they announced some coaching. See, I'm in the same position here because I could have sworn they announced the coaching staff. And that's why when I was doing the notes, I was like, I thought they already had a pitching coach. Hmm. Wakamatsu. Yeah. Baseball ops. They have JT Snow with Mika Frank. Mika Frank, yeah. Mika and Mike, I don't, yeah, I'll mess that up half a dozen times. We'll go, Mike. It's okay. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, they you also do. got Aaron I'll Miles. I'll try to carry that. Yeah. They got Aaron Miles there, too. Mm-hmm. As a third base coach. Yeah, I don't know that they announced more. Yeah, I, f- I feel like they did. And maybe go. it's because they announced a third base coach and we would never otherwise get it. That's kind of, yeah, it's a little random. Yeah, like hey, I respect the respect for third base coach. Hey, we all know third base coach is the one that got to do the work. Yeah, I do all that. They did. It was Ray King. Stretched, it stretched out. It was Hit Ray me? King. Okay, Ray King. Be- yeah, uh, if we are to believe uh, Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, right here. Wakamatsu has already signed nine players with a roster of 35 to be constructed for the start of spring training in May. And Wakamatsu has a manager in place, San Francisco native and former player Mike Armika Franklin, joined by retired left-handed, retired left-hander Ray King as pitching coach. 
That is from the AP hmm. release when they announced the team back in November. Fascinating. What do you make of that? I think that we got a lot of questions is what I make of that. I want to know why Ray King is still not with this organization, right? Like, Sending a text. Sending a text. We'll see. We'll see because what we get it's just, by the it, end of the pod. Yeah, it's just an extremely odd thing here, right? Like you name a guy and then quite literally five months later, it's like, oh, I'm just going to peace out real quick. Now, maybe Ray got a gig somewhere else and got a better, you know, offer for lack of better term. But it just seems very odd that it'd be that quick of a turnaround. And it's, it's so odd that it makes me ask questions. Yeah. But yeah. So you got any thoughts on this Ray King development? I'll hold my thoughts for now. I've sent out my uh, your feeler text. Yeah, we'll see what's up. Uh, yeah, I mean something. The the vibes aren't good. There's been no the vibes weird... are Rocky Mountain. Shut up. I I truly where I again the continued concern with Oakland is if we had the number of weird things happen that have happened in there from their front office and organization since they were announced a few months ago. If we had had those types of things happen, I'm talking like the random coach possibly leaving here, the uh, change of ballpark venue, uh, the kind of iffy marketing strategy, at least in our opinion, if that happened in another organization that had a bad reputation already, we'd be like, whoa, what are we doing? Instead of having an organization with no reputation and we're, you know, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not going to give them a free pass on that. I'm going to be like, hey, this is adding to a list of red flags. Yeah. Again, I, I still think Oakland has a better chance to succeed than maybe any other inaugural like team uh, in indie, that I've seen in any ball over the past decade. But yeah, it's like just, they have they a, cannot fumble the bag here. <laughs> it's such a great level. It's like they got that spot right on the cliff that's nice and level, overlooks the ocean, mm-hmm. and now they're just like, you know what? I bet if we were sort of cut the slope on this hill a little bit, we could really make something cool here. And it's like, you don't have to do that. You could just go ahead and, you know, build a normal house there. And like, and in fact, yeah. with that, you're destroying part of what makes it. It's like living next to a beautiful forest and cutting down the forest to help your view. It's like the fact that Dan you aren't Schneider the, thinking. Well, I mean, it's the fact that you're the not the A's and you're the ballers is the thing. And you instead of focusing on being the ballers, you just keep pointing at the A's. I'm like, no, like. Look internally, my guy. But Brian, You're a new I don't team. You have want, everything you should be focused on right now should be inside that front office. But I don't want a forest view. I want the golf course view. So those trees got to go. Well, I hope you, you should know up, about tree but, removal. I hope you wake up from your nap in the yard after taking a title to the temple. If it's a pro V, it's worth it. Fair. Oh, yeah, fair. Oh, we playing with the good stuff. Oh, oh, we're we're living next to a private course. All right. Yeah. Uh, one last thought on the Ray King thing before we move on to you know actual this frontier. Late. Good Lord. Yeah. Before we move Ooh. on to the Frontier League side of life, uh, it does look like he was still with the team as of mid January. Found one article from the nineteenth of January that said that he was in fact still listed as the pitching coach. So something had to have happened presumably before the 1st of April, so sometime either in the end of January or the months of February or March. So something over the last eight weeks. So, oh, That's 10 good. weeks, I guess. So it's a new development. It's interesting. Let's talk about the Frontier League now. All right, man. I'm about it. Their spar will be quick. Frontier League French camp in Rouen has uh-huh. concluded. Uh, Three Rivers and Quebec both went over there. They each selected a player to bring back with them. And uh, here are the results. We got to the EGALs or EGALs, however you want to go about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm not going to correct it. Leo Jiminian? Jiminian? Right now, I got to check this. Good Lord. J-I-M-I-N-I-A-N. That does nothing for me. 
I forgot about the sign. That's my mistake. Jiminian? That's what I said. They're going silent J, but that would be a choice. Would be a choice. And it goes Leo here, 25 year old outfielder, played two years at East Tennessee State, 47 games in total. A 260, 370, 450 slash line with four home runs, 17 RBIs, and four stolen bags in that time. Admittedly, there was a notable drop off from his first season to his second season. In Quebec, they took a 21 year old right handed pitcher, uh, Thibault Mercadier. Hmm. That one's sure. right, I know. He got there. You got Thibault Mercadier. You really want to give it that little fancy? Get a little hmm. fancy with him. Just from playing for the Canadians. Yeah, he could actually be a hell of a left winger. But he pitched in 20 games, started three of those, went 43 in the third innings, gave up 79 hits. 37 walks, 39 strikeouts, and had an ERA of 13 and a half. Not a bad messer. And that was at Western Nebraska Community College. That's two seasons of work. And any like, thoughts? Uh, Top on, level competition out there, though. So you gotta keep that in mind. Any thoughts on Leo or Tibo? Nope. But I will once again compliment this idea. I think it's a good call. Um, I think it's unlikely these guys make an impact, but I think it's still the right, uh, a, a good thing for them, a good thing for the teams, a good thing for baseball as a whole, and for the league. So I, I have no complaints on this happening. I I mean, it is what it is. I would love to see them go outside of France and understand why they went to France, but I think the hotbed of baseball right now in Europe is uh, has certainly drifted away from, from France for those of us who are tied into the international baseball scene. Well, I agree with that. I will say I want someone to clip the point about Ryan saying neither one of these guys are going to make an impact for when uh, Thibaut oh, yes, Macadier like when, milk, dude. when Thibaut Macadier is closing out game three of a Quebec sweep of like, I don't know, let's say Joliet because, you know, we like Mike Pinto, but uh, we also want to give him more bulletin board material. Hi, Mike, by the way. And um, the most that's Quebec happening, thing possible would be that. Oh, God. The 21-year-old Quebecois going out there, lighting up uh, a veteran team and bringing home another championship. What would that be, number three or four in a row? Uh, something horrifying like that. Just absolute three. nightmare. The, the nightmare in the north. Oh, my God. That is, that's cool. They, they are the back. night king. Yeah. <sighs> Anyway, my suggestion would be Go maybe to the next one. And like, I, I was honestly thinking like put it in Munich because it's the middle ground between Italy and Czech Republic, which is kind of like home. Or about- we'll just say screw it and put the thing. I mean, what about if, Austria? If, if we're talking homegrown talent, like Germany and the Czech Republic is better than Italy. I think. I mean, Italy yeah. is mostly reliant on anybody outside to come back. Uh, France is not bad, but I just think France is not. I mean, Bochy's out there. That's probably part of the tie there. But I mean, like the thing is, some American baseball presence. Sorry to overly analyze the European baseball scene, but like I, I mean, think it's relevant because it would be a great ch- like, channel into indie ball guys. Eventually, I would say I think a European showcase would be good if you put it in two locations: one more Eastern, one more Western. Mm-hmm. Like maybe say one in like Vienna and then one in France. Yeah, or, or you just tie it to you know whatever tournaments they got going on any given year, they, they run a cycle. Yeah. Either way. I mean, anyway, we obviously know that not the get too in the weeds on that, was, so. yeah. Yeah. The yeah. obvious reason is the cultural connection. Right. Sure. And I'm not arguing that. I would just say if, if I were to say anything, I think it would be good to expand that to a second location, perhaps. All I'm going to say is I really hope, uh, Thibault Mercadier makes the roster because that's such a fun name to say. I know. And I'm going to have to wear that one. Like just that being said, though, uh, like low key though, I don't know if he sticks around in Quebec, but being nice twenty one, this screams Pioneer League bait. Already here, already he's got the paperwork done. Mm-hmm. He's already on this side of the damn ocean, but, and they're dragging him out there. But I mean, if Quebec lets him go, I'm sure they're going to do whatever they can to find him in a spot. Like, oh yeah. You know? So there's enough connections yeah. here. Like this dude screams a pitcher for the Rocky Mountain vibes. 
they've gone international before with certainly worse results. <laughs> exactly. So we are now about an hour into the show. Yeah, dude, we really should not have done that. I know, but that uh, whole Oakland YOLO conversation was way deeper than I it thought we were going to get. It escalated a little bit, yeah. But luckily, oh, we only have eight teams in this review. Uh, yeah, I guess that's technically not that bad, depending on how I mean, you want to look at it. <laughs> why don't we just jump right into this Frontier League East review? Surely, man. I mean, I'm excited to see how we want this to go. I never remember. So it's like it's the first time doing this every time. I was about to say. It brings a certain level of excitement, I think. Yeah. Well, as soon as I got through going in the, uh, once I got through the almanac, I was going to go, say the line, Bart. <laughs> Where do you want to begin? <laughs> How do these work? Uh, so stupid. Uh, so last year, Quebec and New Jersey were tied top, but Quebec won the division. Both had a record of 60 and 35. In the case of Quebec, that is two games worse than they did last year, being that they were 62 and 34, while New Jersey improved by 15 games from 54 or 45, rather, and 49. Sussex County finished in third with 55 and 40 record. That is a one game improvement. Tri City was also in a tie there, but lost on tiebreakers. Same record, 55 and 40, also one game improvement. Kind of funny how that works out. Then uh, New York came in behind them by one game with that nice 54 and 42 record, three games worse than the year prior. And then Ottawa was 500 at 48 and 48. They were eight games worse than the year prior, seeing as they won 56 the year before. And then you had, of course, Trois Riviers that was 38 and 57, a seven game demotion on their end. Got significantly worse there, but Empire State was a notable positive, seeing as they went 18 and 77, a 12 game improvement from last season. Good job, boys. Uh, New Jersey defeated Sussex in the wild card game. Quebec defeated New Jersey in three games to win the East Division Championship. And then Quebec, of course, went on to defeat the Evansville Otter in five games to win the championship. So, that is your almanac section there. Say the line, Bart. Uh, where do you want to begin? Actually, I actually had a quick thought before this, uh, and just getting your opinion on one dumb thing. Okay. Um, and, and it was because maybe I'm surprised, but maybe some stupid. Uh, very open. Be both. Uh, you know, just might be. <laughs> it, it really. Now I know 2021 was a weird one, so kind of a mixed bag. Can you pull back and all that. It's kind of. Interesting to see how well these former Can Am teams are doing. Do you think that's like a long term trend or like they're gonna get caught? Like how long do you think it's gonna take as somebody who who was doing this podcast like during the Can Am days as well and you were a little more acquainted with them because I, I jumped in any ball just after the Can Am wrapped up. Uh, is I mean, was this the expected result? Is this kind of surprising? What well you what see back in on? my day? Kids <laughs> these days, I don't remember. To answer the question, I would say it's to some level expected. Obviously, there was concessions made on the Frontier League roster to have some older guys to be able to accommodate those, you know, Can Am League rosters coming over, and they had better veterans off the bat because they were already on the roster, right? And so, to that extent, I think it was to a degree expected. To the level it has been, I don't know. But at the same point in time, there has been newer teams that have done well, right? Ottawa did well last year. And what was really like the true first year. I mean, you mentioned 21 was all screwy with Team Quebec and the weird division setup. And that's just not really a true test, right? It was really just yeah. odd setup. So really just going off of the small sample size of 22 and 23. I think it really has been all that crazy. I mean, yeah, you have Quebec, but Quebec's always good. It doesn't matter what league they're right. in. Historically speaking, they're always good. So they're the outlier here. And outside of that, I mean, you had the Boulders the one year and then the Jackals and the Miners the other year. And the Miners really only got in because they got extraordinarily hot at the end, right? They won, what was it, seven right. in a row to finish the season? So... Like, I just chalked it up to a hot team. If you look outside of that, 
you could have made a real case that, oh, well, Tri-City should have been in there, New York should have been in there. It was kind of a hard fought, you know, fight, I guess, for yeah. that spot. And then the year prior to that, yeah, it was an upset for Ottawa. I mean, you're looking at a team, what, a 37 or a 57 and 38 team versus a 56 and 39 team. So it's not that much of an upset, but even still, I'm not sure it's been like overwhelmingly can am, I guess is my point. But okay. there's certain I oh, would say I mean, that the little bit of an edge they've had so far isn't like totally out of the blue. The second half of how long until levels out, I think we're gonna start seeing that sooner and sooner because you think about it, most of those sets are moving on to other things now. Right. Mm-hmm. I and mean, there's not a lot of guys that have stayed like since twenty nineteen. I mean, yeah, we're five years in on it. So I expect like this year and next year for it to really start to level out. Okay. Interesting. And plus, I guess there's also the thought of the Can-Am teams have also had uh, the last two years, the Empire State teams to rack up some extra wins on, which crazy how quickly that adds up. I'm going to, def- I'm going to go against that point. I know that's not what we're doing here, but I'm going to go against okay. it a little bit because I remember distinctly having to fight this narrative all last year. We kept saying, oh, the East is the better division. It's way more competitive. The West is like Gateway, a little bit of Evansville, and that's about it. There really isn't much of a notable difference. If I dig through the book, I could find you the exact amount of difference here, but have like a a season-altering effect, I guess I should say. I I guess. I I get what you mean, but... If you rack four extra wins, you know, off by playing them, I mean, that does bump you up a bit. I mean, let's say, you know, if it was an average team there instead of the Empire Empire State, like, Capitals so, could be behind Gateway and wins. Like, I don't know. That's all I'm saying. We were going too far into this. I, this is not necessarily the point. But I got my numbers now, so I do want to use a very few numbers. Go for it. So I did both a number with the... Uh, including those games against Empire State and then without it, and then if you were to subtract it, what the record would wind up being. So I'm just going to go off of the actual run per game record. So Quebec gained an extra .1 runs per game from playing Empire State. New Jersey gained .4. Tri-City gained .1. New York gained .1. Sussex County gained .3. Ottawa gained .3. So we're talking less than half a run a game here. Yes, uh, I don't want to go in too deep here, and I and I agree it's probably under it's overstated probably what the difference is. But I also now I'm also like it's also you know what pitchers did you have to use for the Empire State series and things like that, you know? Because I've seen it before. I'm like you know they give up. There were a couple of games where it was like oh Empire State offense woke up a little bit this weekend, and you're like well they didn't face the top three relievers more than once. It's like. Oof. That's all. I mean, it's a complicated one. It's, I guess, the main takeaway is it's not so easy to just say, "Hey, X, X, and Y happened because of Empire State." It's going to always be a mix, and you brought up some good points on that one. Hmm. I'll back off. I'll back off. All right. So, in the spirit of keeping things going, good lord, Richard. knowing that we're going to talk heavily about Quebec and New Jersey, and people know yep. this walking in, and we know this walking in. Sorry. Why don't we start at the bottom and work our way to the top here? Surely that works. So let's keep talking about Empire State then. Mark okay. Mason comes in there. Um, obviously, there's no way other than to put it. Uh, they were a bad team. Yep. Improved, yes, but still bad. Right. Like you mm. won 18 games. Like that's not good. That's I did get to deck. see them win, though. I, I have tickets to cool. watch them beat uh, Sussex County. In fact, so walk off. Well, as close yeah, yeah, to man. watch as you can get there. So. <laughs> Ninth and he win, I should call it. Yeah, I was gonna say true. I guess I can't walk that off. That's kind of sucks, by the way. Under understated suckage on that one. Oh, dude, to walk, Sussex walk led the whole way, way, and then in the eighth it was tied. Then the ninth it went their way. It wasn't Damn. great. I, <laughs> I was like watching. I was like, I want to <laughs> see Sussex win, but like low key though. <laughs> How many times are you gonna get watch Grace? I think I went up to two minor games last year, and both times they were playing Empire State, and both times Empire State won. <laughs> Hmm. Tough scene. That's tough to take. That's, 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 that's why they don't talk to me anymore. 
Who, I mean, one of many possibilities, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, though, like actually discussing Empire State, the tough part is the second I start getting good players, they move on to other teams sometimes in the same league. So that's right. a tough scene. And it's just kind of impossible to build anything there. That being said, I still kind of feel like they exceeded their expectation for the year. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Like, especially seeing how bad it was the year before. Like Mark felt like the right guy for that room where it's just kind of like, yeah, Mark did. Right. Yeah. Which I I mean, I, Mark has been a guy that I've heard good things about and was always impressed by the number of guys at York who spoke all of them. And you know, he must be, he must have that energy. So that works. I mean, and he kept it motivated through there. He's taken on another new challenge this year. So yeah, he seems like a guy who's down for the grind, man. Yeah. No, I mean like you you gotta be in that case, right? Like you gotta be willing to just go there and get handled every game. I mean, you're going to get kicked in the teeth. It's not even just the number of losses, the number where you just know you're going in without the weapons you would need to have a fair fight. And yeah. just knowing you're going to get kicked in the teeth, it sucks. And you know you're going to be on the road, too, from May through August. It's a long time on the road, never having really, like, uh, your own space, so to speak. Of. Mm-hmm. So, like... It could either tear you apart or it could bring you really close together. And the fact you keep the band together and you're strung together nearly 20 wins. I mean, like, that's the thing, too. They're only, what, 20 games worse than Three Rivers? Which, when you put it in that context, it really isn't, like, that huge of a difference. Like, I'm not going to say 20 20 games, but, like, you think of the advantages of being... Yeah, like you think of the advantages of being an actual franchise that has a place to go and like all that comes with it mm-hmm. versus, you know, a team that's born to die, has no real weapons, and is on the road for 96 games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. This is really I'm so I'm so glad I pressed it's not a thing anymore, just for everyone's sake. Oh god, three years ago. Oof, yeah, that would not been a vibe. Um, I know they would have to stay yeah. in Rocky Mountain. Yeah, <laughs> um, Josh Sears was really good, by the way. I played ninety-one games for them. You know, he was a solid bat. Young guy too, twenty-four. Okay, he make but, he go pick around. Yeah. What's he doing this year? I don't know. So I got to check right now. Um, I would be surprised that if he doesn't land somewhere, right? I mean. I mean, 275, 365, 462, 16 homers for Empire State. I can't believe I'm not finding him anywhere. It's so weird. Huh. Huh. Well, we'll have to keep an eye on that then. Because, yeah, he should be somewhere. Like, he's got to be after that year. No one, no one drops that year as, like, the only above average hitter on Empire State and then doesn't, and, like, grinds the whole year for it. And then Apparently you're following him on Twitter. How about it? I am. I don't know. Anything interesting on his Twitter? A lot of Auburn. Ah, that explains it. But he's a UAB oh. guy. Huh. Interesting. Hmm. But yeah, Josh Sears looked good. Um, I mean, literally, he was the only player I have that was a, at league average or better uh, across the entire and across the entire team. I mean, Tyler Bryant was close to something. Nineteen games, four point one three ERA. Right, that's from 2023. So, for what it may be worth, prior to last season, his rights got dealt from Quebec to Gateway, and they obviously wound up on Empire State. So, maybe looking that way. Interesting. Don't know what to make of that, gotta be honest. Three rivers. Uh, is it like they met the expectation this year because we didn't think they were going to be good, but like at the same point in time, yeah, yeah. dude, it's a it's a rough year when you got to put out a statement saying we're disappointed in our performance. We got that was it. odd. Yeah, what was we never really? I feel like we didn't talk about that enough because that was crazy. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of me is like that's encouraging, and other part of me is like that is not encouraging. Oh, it's like, very concerning. On actually. one hand, it's like, oh, look, they care about the fans, so they're they're showing their disapproval or approval too. But on the flip side, it's like, what how many fire alarms are going off over there? Yeah, seriously, damn son. Is this I the mean, dog with the house it ain't, on fire? It ain't the owner going down to the clubhouse to have a chat with the whole team and the manager, but you know, it's not <laughs> good. 
Yeah. Not that I won't do that. That'd be extremely unprofessional. I know. Yeah. Like if you were to just, I don't know, something crazy, like walk down there and just huss out the whole team for losing a game and like extra innings or something like that. Especially when you have like a winning record. That'd be really crazy. Buddy, do we have more Chicago reporting coming? Potentially. Electric. Anyway, yeah. uh, where were we? I yeah, would say. We're doing more work on oh, that front. Oh, yeah. Certainly the pitching was the bigger issue here. I mean, it, 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 oh, yeah, like, here's the thing, on, like, yeah. When I was looking at this team, like doing the preview on it, not that I the was, offense was good. Oh, I don't yeah, know. I, no, the I offense was, like, was fine. The like, people, I'll put it like this like, people know how I've been doing this, right? Where it's like yeah. the, I go like good, meh, or uh, bad, right? Yeah. I had them on the edge between good and meh. Because there's some okay. actual quality, like, they look good in some areas. They were top five, top six in a lot of areas across the whole league. So that's yeah. pretty solid. You're top five in a 16-team league. In other areas, they weren't as strong, but still, overall, it's pretty good. It's just their pitching is abysmal. I mean, my God, it's it's, hor- it's horrid. I so, like, not have a single pitcher on their staff as league average, according to my math. Like, yikes. And the standards I keep. Like, the best one I had was... Um, no, that's a lie. I had one. Tuck, Tucker Smith, I think okay. I would call at least average performance wise. And that's mainly because, yeah, he had a good ERA, but like it was not pretty how we got there. And, you know, he still gave up a good number of unearned runs. It was just like, even it's one I, we talked about last week. Those teams was like a, a yeah, but team. Like, yeah, like Tucker Smith had a good year. And I, I do think he has good potential as a young guy coming through his league. But even like the way he got to his sub four ERA was was rough. Yeah. Fair. Damn. Covered some innings though. Yeah. Him and Osman Gutierrez. So shout out there. True. Yeah. Osman Gutierrez um, almost took out 10 for nine, which is nice to see. Brandon Bell. I mean, for, and I mean, only 34 innings, never mind. Yeah. But still, he looked yeah. good while he was out there. True. True. Not a lot of mm-hmm. strikeouts though. Contact pitcher. Yeah. Con- which control issue work. too. Yes, you definitely. That was, I was going to say that can work if you're not walking people like he was, but yeah, 20, um, 20. You got there, you got down the list before I could. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm looking for positives and it's a little difficult. Uh, they got to figure out what they're doing with the pitching. I would basically hold serve on the whole offense. You can get league average. I think of it this way. I mean, well, I mean, you're probably losing he, Steve Brown. I mean, he's 36 at this point. Yeah, fair. But I mean, how many teams? I mean, so I, it's so hard because here's the problem. Because I will like, say, average yeah. offense. If you get the uh, the pitching to average, you should have a shot at the playoffs. But really, you have to be in this league in the top, you know, three out of eight. So like, average offense and average defense ain't gonna cut it. You need to good division is probably not gonna cut it. It's probably not gonna get Tri City handled. It's probably not gonna deal with Sussex the way you need. Uh, you're lucky because the Jackals seem like they're gonna be struggling, but Quebec like. There's so much cleanup work to do on that, man. I feel for you. Yeah, but like, that's, the, that's why they're always my out of the park baseball team. Yeah. See, because you know in the East you got two spots. Quebec's taking the top one. Yeah. And then you don't know who's going to take the other two. So you're playing in a wild card game no matter what. Like these guys on the offense here that I really do like. Victor Cerny's one of them. Nate Scantlin's another one. Uh, who Austin Markman could be better. You could upgrade there, I think, personally, but whatever. Um, there's guys here. My concern is that how many of these guys are you going to be able to bring back? Like Oscar Hernandez, 29. You have a bunch of 25 year olds here. Dalton Combs is 28. Uh, Pellier is 27. State Brown is 36. Ricardo Sanchez is 28. These are all veteran spot guys, dude. Like Brandon Datsun, kind of a similar boat. Mm-hmm. He's 26. You're really getting up there close to veteran spots on a lot of guys. So that's going to handicap you a lot. I know they re-signed Cerny, which I do like a lot. I think he's going to be their catcher, if I'm not mistaken. I think he is a catcher. So a catcher that can hit 300 is worthwhile as a 24-year-old, right? So, well, now 25-year-old, but still. I think there is still a lot here that could work. Yeah, he is a catcher. But it's just tough here. And like, we mentioned it last week when we were talking about, oh, yeah, haha, with the rankings. And I know you better not have Matt Roush on. But, like, legitimately, though, he's had a rough go of it. And I don't know if that's just the situation he's placed in with the organization or yeah, if that speaks more to this ability. 
and I don't want to comment too heavily one way or the other, but because his first year, like 22, wasn't terrible, right? Five games under 500 for what's expected of try uh, three rivers as of normal. That's not bad. But this year, I mean, like we're talking nearly 20 games under, man. Like that's that's bad. Yeah. Um, I'm just, and I'm trying to figure out like where do you fix this, <laughs> which is a yeah. good conversation just earlier that we're having, but it is interesting to think on. I mean, if you go, I mean, they should be seeing more pitches. They should be working counts better. Um, I, I think they're probably leaving. If they can do that, I think they have an offense which probably can produce closer to 540 runs, which is yeah. right below Quebec, which is interesting. But they do not draw enough walks. They don't get on base enough. Um, that, that's for sure. And by the way, their on-base pitch isn't bad, it, but it's because their batting average is actually really high. Yeah. And look, maybe attacking early is, is part of what gets them there, but... You got to start finding some ways on base, especially when you're not a home run team. Like you got to have some guys on base for when you, so you can get guys run in and get get some movement there. That's all. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think where you start picking up those pieces. It's going to be tough, but but damn, I, don't, I mean, the pitching staff's a, a hard reset, unfortunately. Which it's kind of weird because you'd think like Matt Roush is a guy that was a pitcher, and he pitched yeah. well in that ballpark. Now, of course, he's was an extremely good can like pitcher. I mean, mm-hmm. look at his numbers, and as they'll speak for themselves, really had one bad year, and that was his last true full time year in seventeen. And even then, that was over two hundred or one hundred twenty six innings. So, like you know, good workload. But you would think he'd be able to do a better job at identifying pitchers that are helping guys pitch that ballpark. It's just kind of odd. Again, it could just be an organization thing too. I don't want to rule that out. Well, it's also uh, I think it's also going to be worth considering, and we can't really even discuss this too much because who knows. But if let's take the subcategory of guys who are willing to sign a contract in Canada, true, that is a huge. And thing. then and then look at the fact that probably the number one pick for that. I mean, guys, we hear a lot about guys who like to play in Quebec and guys who like to play yeah. in Ottawa. I just have never heard it about that. I had some friends who went up to to see Trois Rivier uh, this past year, and they were like, "Dude, it was a good time. It was just, you know, kind of flat, and like it's just a different energy. It's a different level of like what the ballpark is, and you know, a different level of town. Like, Ottawa, you know, Quebec City, and you know, Trois Rivier is a different different energy. So, I think they're the third pick out of getting guys who are willing to come to Canada, and I think that's also going to constantly. Yeah, or Winnipeg. Sorry, just folks on the frontier. But yeah, I mean, okay. that's a fair point as well. Um, though I, I theorize Winnipeg has a different, uh, almost a totally different vibe as well because it's such a weird mix. Man, and that's a different it's conversation. Different. <laughs> you got to get those Western boys out there. Um, yeah, so I think that's also worth considering and there's not so much you can do about that. You got to find your own sort of thing, really. <laughs> your own hook. Yeah. That's a challenge, man. It's true. It's an interesting situation. Well, uh, they're going to be fun to do the preview on because they could go a lot of different mm-hmm. ways. So. Yeah, I mean, okay. You and I feel like maybe differently then. Uh, yeah, I think here's the thing. By a lot of different ways, I mean a lot of different ways of constructing a roster. Okay, fair. I'm with yeah, you I, I think they're kind of, unfortunately, unless they get similar offensive production with better pitching, which means everybody's goal, you know, mm-hmm. well, mostly everyone, I should say, it because there's some teams here where it's like, ooh, I don't know. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> exactly. It, unfortunately, unless they really do have like a couple of world breakers, and I think that really what it comes down to is either they got to get hot at the right time, or you need like one or two real world breakers to make the playoffs in the Frontier League. Uh, I think so. And then to survive those playoffs, that's a different conversation. Tyler, yeah. you just want to get there for them. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a fair fair statement yeah. on that. Yeah. The only thing I will say, and this will be the last point before we go on to Ottawa, is when TJ Stanton was there, he had success. He built Yeah, the that's teams. a good point. Now, granted, that is also under a Can-Am League setup, but you look at that, the teams he had there, and he put together really, really solid clubs, really deep clubs. So, obviously, the Can-Am League is a whole different ball of wax, different animal entirely. But 
it's not impossible to build a solid roster. It's more or less my point. And that's why I think kind of gives me some hope that it's doable. It's just you need to go after the right guys and you need to get lucky on a few. Yeah, I agree. I don't think it's impossible for sure. I think it might just be finding your rhythm and the new league and all that. I mean, there's some growing pains for sure on multiple sides there. So, you know, I don't think this team is condemned to the bottom. You know, those teams certainly exist in any ball, but I, I don't think it's that situation. I think it's it, there's it's definitely a, one of the more uphill climbs you have. Yeah, certainly. Uh, moving on to Ottawa, uh, they had a real, I don't want to call it a miracle run, but a really magical run, I guess, against Quebec, <laughs> pushed them to the brink in 22. I mean, they, were really, they, they weren't really supposed to get in. They weren't supposed to do a lot. I think a lot of people, including myself, thought, okay, New York should handle these guys. They're a better team. And then did not at all go that way. And then they really did scare Quebec a lot. But Quebec is Quebec, and they just refused to die and then kind of pulled it out with a couple of walk-off shots. In fact, that's kind of their calling card in the postseason. And, Isn't it, though? Yeah. And so coming into this year, they – at least for me, had like a raised expectation because year one was so good and they did an awful lot. And I think I kind of fell into the trap of, you know, the team that gets hot and does a lot of good, then you think of them a lot better off, you know? So I kind of had them as they didn't quite reach the expectation. They failed to meet it, but maybe I was a little harsh on them. They were just kind of like perfectly average when it came to pitching, perfectly average when it came to batting. Like they fluctuated around a little bit in the middle, but I never really saw them at the bottom or the top of anything. So it's like they're just another team. And I mean, they were 500, so they are kind of like perfectly balanced as all things should be in a sense. Yeah. Um. If we're talking about, I mean, did they reach expectations? Hmm. Yeah, I would say. I mean, I, they were not super impressive in either in any category. Like, and that you know, and then you're a 500 team. And you go, well, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, should they? Well, for starting expectations, should they be better? I don't know. I mean, that pitching. I I, I would say they might have failed to meet expectations. Honestly, uh, I yeah. I would have expected maybe a more complete roster put together after the success from the previous year. And that's that's it, where I was just, at, yeah. yeah, just to find. I mean, they had some good pitching. Augie Gallardo, uh, Damon Cassetta Stubbs, Grant Larson, Erasmo Pinellas. He was very good, very good. But yeah. uh, on offense, then that is not. That's a that's a good pitching staff and get you, you through some things. It's a couple good starters, a couple good relievers. But then they had a pretty sizable gap from there down to like a bunch of sort of below average bullpen pieces. That's a struggle. Uh, the the yeah. the, the last half of the the rotation was always tough. Zach Westcott really never found himself, but he did eat innings like a champ. Um, it, but I mean, when you bring in Zach Westcott, you're really just hoping for not a five six ERA. So five six was that, that that hurt. He was not missing bats. Yeah, I mean, he was uh, going to that the year prior was really really important. Yeah, yeah, it was that was a huge loss for them because then you look for like Cassetta Stubbs to fill that gap as a twenty three year old, which I don't think he was what they they maybe they thought Grant Larson might be that guy, but it ended up being Damon. It's a lot to ask from a, a young guy like that in that situation. It, it, you know, it, they, they, you could tell they did put some pieces in place that they thought were going to work. You could see what they were seeing, but it, it just yeah. wasn't there. I mean, offensively, they did have, I mean, I'd say most of their lineup, I would consider above average for the league. I mean, Jamie Smart, uh, AJ Wright, Taylor Wright, um, Sicknar Loofstock, uh, great name. Austin Davis. Way. I know. Austin Davis, good young player. Um, only played 43 games for them, but I, I he could have potential in the league if that's where he's going. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason Decochia, I always mess up that name. I mean, that's a good base. Gosh, yeah, uh, yeah. Beyond that, even Jackie Urbaez seemed to have moments. Oh, yeah, no, but Jackie it, it had just, a good year. For that's a, guy a that's good lineup. Not, that's yeah. a, a lineup that can be solid when it's all together, but when it is having an off, even then, it's just, but you need pitching to also be on. It's not the type of lineup that can buy you a, a blow-up inning in a second and then holding on. Like, you know, it's nice when you have one of those teams where you can go six runs in the second, and then your your pitching staff can be like, "All right, hold it and just keep it there," and then your offense can chip away at it. it. Just never really felt like one of those teams. Ottawa never really felt like they were a threat like that. 
Yeah, and I feel like they bring in a guy like Joey Tostovich, and he never really, you know. Mm, yeah, him. another one. Yeah, yeah, and that really does hurt you. And that's, again, where I'm saying, like, I could see what they were going for. And that's why I think I give them a failed me expectation, because I do feel like they they, didn't they were putting there. something together, and it just they didn't get the result they thought. So, I mean, I think it, if you really asked their front office, they, it failed to meet expectations. I guess that's, you know, yeah. eh, probably fair. Yeah, and honestly, I want to just get the name right, but there's a player from last year that you can notice they, they missed. I think it was Jacob Sanford, if I'm not mistaken. I think I made Jake Sanford, my mistake. Mm-hmm. He was really solid for Ottawa mm-hmm. in 22. He only was there for 30 games at 23. Mm-hmm. And when you're taking a guy that hit 22 home runs, 73 RBIs, and you know, he slugged over 500, had an OPS of nearly 900. My favorite stat of batting average, he was a 311 for those keeping track, and he had 91 mm-hmm. games played. You take that out of the lineup, and you don't really have anyone to replace it. It kind of starts to notice that, you know, like that. Yeah. I'm not sure what his actual war would be, but that feels like the difference between two, three games. Now, does that get you in? Probably not, but it well, definitely doesn't because we know what was needed was 55, but I mean, those three games get you 51, right? And maybe mm-hmm. the way you construct your lineup gets you another three games. Now you're at 54, and all of a sudden, now you're knocking on the door. And now you're not playing the same way down the stretch. So maybe that's yeah. another two, and then all of a sudden, boom, you're in the wild card. Yeah, uh, and that's really it. And yeah. I can't really be too harsh on it. That's not one where I look at and I'm like, man, yeah, I'm like, I don't, there's teams I, out there I'm like, yeah. what are we doing out here? Yeah, like that's the thing. Like, there was direction here. And it's just didn't like, plan out. Yeah, exactly. And it's almost like they're getting penalized because of success and because they had a plan and it just didn't work. As opposed to say like a Three Rivers where it's like, I hope you guys had a plan, but I don't really see what it was here. Yeah. Um, I mean, by the way, Jake Sanford, he was at least scoring two for Angelic Savant, a 2.1 yeah. war. Okay, uh, so I guess in, that 20, right. in 2022, and then he was a zero war guy in 2023. Okay, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's hard to do. So, yeah, that's tough to replace. And it's, yes, it is. I mean, you could try to money ball the aggregate on it, but, you know, that's but again, a lot now, easier to get also, done. Yeah, because you're already dealing, it's. I guess maybe Ottawa would be a good example of a team that could try the money ball angle of like you're you are dealing with a non ideal situation trying to get a lot of guys up to Canada, um, but I mean, sure. It, but at a certain point, I mean, how many times can you do that? Because you're also doing that, keeping in mind we're talking about with Westcott, um, uh, Jaroslavich, like yeah, it, it's how like- it's a lot. You can do that one or two. It's hard to do that on the fly mid season making, and, and that requires also making that call mid-year of being like this is what we're getting from this guy or he's not coming back whatever the case may be yeah and it's the thing, easier said than done and the thing with aggregate for me at least is when you're getting rid of a player or you need to replace a player i always view it as kind of like patching the boat or repairing the boat right like in an ideal world you wouldn't have to patch three holes in your boat you just get a new boat mm-hmm. but you're in a position where it's like we don't have the luxury of being able to find another boat so <laughs> Let's go ahead and find some extra boards to patch up this hole so we don't sink as soon as we get more than 10 feet out the harbor. So it, when you start getting there, it's like, okay, well, we've got to hope that these replacements work and they, these repairs hold because if they don't, then what's going to happen? And then for every other repair, you're putting stress elsewhere in the lineup because if one guy doesn't repeat what they had or even not even doesn't repeat, if they just like get picked up themselves, now what are you doing? Now you're really right. stretching it thin. And it's like, it's the difference between, I guess, having a really thick line that's short and having a, a really thin line that's long, I guess, right? Like they cover, I guess, the same amount of surface area, but depending on how you're, you know, what you need the line to do, one's better than the other. I guess. I always just go back to the Roman columns. Talking about the aggregates is like 
and I'm an analytics guy for the most part, but it is, you know, when you start to do the money ball thing of like, how can we make this guy by getting three guys? It's like, okay, you have to understand that there's only so much you can do there. Cause you have so many roster spots. If you lose five great guys, you can't add 15 guys that add up to them because you don't have roster space for that. So you do need guys then that fill multiple roles for guys you've lost. If that's the case. And then you have to, instead of betting on one big thing, like one, one big piece to go well and as expected, you're betting on three smaller ones to all go as expected. And, and there's obviously increased chance that that doesn't happen. So it, it does complicate it every time you do it. And as I said, once you have thrown three or more holes in the boat, it's kind of like, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, this is getting a little sketchy, my guy. So yeah, yeah, I yeah, feel yeah. for them. I'd like to see a roster with a little more, maybe a little more complete, you know, show up next year and do something. Like I see, again, I see what they saw. It's it just that the the flaws that could get exposed kind of got exposed in it, unfortunately. Mm, yeah. So let's move on to New like, York. Like Jamie Smart, by the way. I'm just going to shout that yeah, out. Yeah, no, he was, he was solid in yeah. Chicago or yeah, Wendy City, rather, uh, yeah. for a year or two as well. But uh, Solid year. Yeah. The New York now, uh, TJ Stanton. I thought the batting was good, but I think that's a largely nice park factor thing. Um, okay. pitching was met, but again, I kind of again park factor type of thing. It always seems like they get good batting in New York, so mm-hmm. you look at the constant. I mean, yeah, if we're gonna go that way, we can talk hitting first. I, I right. park factors, sure, but I also I do believe. I mean, this was a good lineup. I oh, think. Yeah, I'm not uh, spreading that. Kibble Han and Tucker Nathan's uh, had very good years. Each of them. Uh, I mean, that's. Yeah. It's to talk about two of the best contributors over 30 in the league. Uh, I mean, they're right there. Yeah. Uh, you wonder how much longer they're going to be able to keep that going. But Yeah, I think you know, hands done, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's what I saw as well. Yeah. Um, but Tucker's just, Tucker just, just wonder. Yeah, that's just what we're doing. Um, Got to shout McDermott. out Chris Quitzer, too. Got to get some Chris Quitzer. Love yeah, him Chris Quitzer. I mean, I would say he held around, I mean, 301. You'd like to see. A little more pop out of 400 plate appearances for sure, but it, 21 bags, it though. works. Agreed. And that's, I don't know, that's something I, I did like with him. I mean, yeah, it's a good point. I mean, probably, a, yeah, it's a good year. I mean, average above average year for sure for the league standard. Yeah. And that's what you're looking for. I mean, you have to get down to probably on any given day, probably this eight spot, maybe the seven spot, depending on how the lineup looks to get down to like below average batters that you don't need your best stuff on. Mm-hmm. That's a good lineup. It's just when it got to the pitching, there's you weave and you know, I usually break it down just for my sort of simple references, like yeah. into like good, like above average, below average, well above average, well below average. I mean, you have to go to below average in my in my list until you find the first starting pitcher and that guy was still like three guys down i mean we're talking well below average <laughs> like we're talking like 10 yeah. percent below average to the league before yeah, you hit exactly. alec Huertas and can start talking about the rotation because they did have good pitching let's not sleep on it dylan smith was oh, yeah. really good out of the really really good um he's been coming you know, for some years now and he finally arrived on it yeah, I I'm with you there. And then Aaron Dona, yeah. you know, he Donna also good very too. good season. Actually, I actually slightly like Aaron Dona, um, not quite as much as Dylan Smith, but I I like Here's him. He's so young. Once twenty three, once twenty six. That's the difference. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. Ryder to watch. Did get, awesome. get three starts, and I got to check what their splits look like on that one. But um, yeah. Dylan Smith's strikeout numbers were crazy. Yeah. Then you got uh, Ryder Yak, uh, Yakel Yakel. Yeah. I always mess that up. Weston Lombard yeah. and Zach Schneider. All relievers still, and then even when you get to the sort of the guys that we consider like had a below average year, Mitchell Sanger, also a reliever, Brandon Backman, also mostly a reliever, and then you have a starter. Like it is, I mean, the best starter was looking like a four six to a five ERA. Like that's tough, dude. It's you can't win that like that. Really missed Verchansky, man. And they really yeah. missed Danny. If they could have had him back again, obviously there's restrictions that make it impossible. But right. like. They could have kept them. Mm-hmm. Man, this team would have been it. I mean, could have, yeah. It. 
the depth would have been the problem, but they would have been a playoff team. I'll put it like that. And if you're able to learn from your mistake from last year, and instead of going Sosa and then leaving Rachansky on the side in case you need him, you just say, screw that. Rachansky starts. Even if you got to skip one at the end to make sure that's his spot in the rotation, you roll with that. And then you worry about Quebec when you get to Quebec. Yeah. Um... Also, in the case of Schneider, I just want to point one thing out too. We, since uh, 21, he has over 100 innings in relief. Actually, between this past season, 23 and 22, he comes in just under 100. He's at 96. So he yeah. has gotten a decent amount of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I think um, that's maybe part of the drop off. I'm trying to see. I can't remember. Rachansky, did they trade? I don't think they did. I don't think that was a trade of Charleston, was it? No, I think that may have been just a don't just walks, dude. Yeah, I think that may be doing it solid. That. And that's where we start to get into organizations that, in my opinion, you know, that's you, you can't let that happen, man. Like he's having a hell of a year in 2022. I'm with you there, but like. I get you can't move him like that in 2022, but if you know, like, are they not? Though, is the, man, like he, I know. Is it, was he up against a roster restriction, or did he just choose to leave? He just went to Charleston, I guess. I mean, I can that see must that have too. Been. I mean, it couldn't have been a roster restriction that got him because there's yeah. no way that you would let him walk as a 25 yeah. year old lefty thrown like that. Like, there's yeah, just like no way. Five years than me. Yeah, but you like, know, dude, he I lived in be... New York and chose to leave. That's a tough scene, man. I wouldn't be shocked because I know he got picked up at one point. I don't think it was last year. I think it was the year before. I want to say it was by either Arizona or Milwaukee. And he was there for a short period of time and then came back. And I know. Might have been Milwaukee because they picked him up. They drafted him, I think. Well, see, but uh, he never. It wouldn't have been that because he failed the physical with Milwaukee. That's right. Oh, my God. Then he got signed again and he failed the physical Mm -hmm. again. I know what is going on in that elbow, my guy. Things with the Mariners now, if I'm not mistaken. It's good for him. Signed with the Mariners in 2024, February. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Hey, that's the physical to get that done. Hey, yeah. And the thing is, you know, he has the ability to stick. He's shown that. Let's see what we got here. We're hoping for the best here. Assigned to Arkansas from Arizona. They had him down in Arizona for the spring, it looks like, and then. Brought him back right. to Arkansas, man. That's Double not eight. bad. Yeah, dude. All right. Yeah, that was so pretty we'll, solid. We'll have to keep an eye on that. We'll maybe have a Danny Wachanski uh, update at some point. Might just be yeah. placeholder, but let's stay optimistic. Yeah, no, I mean, that just happened the other day, like two, three days ago. So, and he's that's right. And they haven't Rico. opened. Double A hasn't opened yet. So, yeah. Uh, well, they open soon, though. Don't they open this week? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. And I remember reading he- April 9th. Yeah. I remember hearing uh, uh, I think when he was doing one of the like influencer type things hmm. he mentioned that Puerto Rico was a big reason why he got signed this past year and I mm, think yeah. Yadier Molina put in a good word for him and that's kind of what got him signed that's a good word to get man it sure is so uh, let's see. But yeah let's back on track with uh, the boulder so that way we keep this moving um yeah, overall, I do like the lineup a lot. The pitching was what held them back, and really, it's just the starting pitching. So I hope they clean that up because, man, they're they're a good team. It's just they always have that problem getting over the hump. Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I agree. Ugh. Any other That's thoughts on them? Or I, I'm just I'm just considering, you know. Who else kind of help them get this done? It just you, you can't have you know five starters outside of the top. You know, not I mean, not a single starter really listed in the top half of the league and starting pitchers. Like it just I call it top third. It just doesn't work, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's we'll see. We'll see if they can bring someone else back. Uh, I get that it can be tough to get some pitching going over there, but I got to find a solution. That it, I'm just caught up on the Rachansky thing, just double checking that. Yeah, he just walked. Um, it's tough one to take, man. It, it's it's hard that there's no. Uh, I, I'm I would if there's going to be a path. This is off topic. If there's going to be a path that indie ball teams working together, it's going to be indie ball leagues working together. It's going to be to have a contract buyout process on contracts. Hmm. 
in my opinion. Kind of wild. Same. All right. Because if you're New York, dude, you got hosed. <laughs> you got a hose there, dude. Uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. where are we going? Uh, we're going to Tri City. This is going to be fun. We got Pete's last year there. Um, got a little wild. Yeah. Uh, they hit. That was good for them, but mm-hmm. uh, the pitching. How about that? Yeah. And How they just, about that? I feel bad for them, too, because they were like right on the cusp of it, right? Like they were right there for making it and they just again fell just short and i feel so bad this organization. but like I mean, at a certain it, point right we talked about it is it at that point is it bad luck or is it you know yeah something else i i'm kind of right it feels like something yeah. else so it'll it be interesting to see right i mean because they've really only had two stars dwayne marshall falling off was unexpected and nick bells are not doing well it was also kind mm-hmm. of unexpected yeah, also um, yeah dame bb didn't really you know perform either but wasn't terrible but it was really bios and vargas that were doing all the heavy lifting pitching wise and then you look at the bullpen velez was solid uh gudon was solid and, and losing mccusker in the middle of the year did not help oh yeah that no, definitely sure. didn't help at all um pavement parks turning into a two-way player was helpful though yeah it works yeah, no play. Honestly, the more I'm looking at the bullpen, it wasn't bad. Blake Workman was good. Uh, Brock Warren was solid, although he kind of was a swing man. And Huntley was all right, I think. Yeah, I mean, he was all right. I mean, uh, let me see here. I- I'm still looking at batting and what that lineup was looking like today. Uh, funny how much you forget. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it really is. I mean, Blake Workman, obviously, was a dog while he was there. Um mm-hmm. We're, we're looking bullpen. Uh, Raymond Goodwan, fantastic. But I mean, I would say if we're talking rotation, I mean, like actual rotation pieces of Vargas, Baez, BB, like I would say, I mean, they're all average, which is not a bad. Having three average starting pitchers is cool if you have some above average starting pitchers, which they did not. Hmm. And again, that puts us back in the conversation like the New York Boulders, very similar, honestly, is, hmm. you know, every other pitcher they had, I would say, is. Well, outside of what I would consider league average, I mean, we're looking at five ERAs, uh, six ERAs basically outside of the first three starters throughout the year. Mm-hmm. So that won't get it done, especially when your best ERA is a three seven. Yeah. You know, not all about ERA, but if we're just looking at you know basic numbers here, that's what it doesn't look good. I mean, sure, the bullpen was a situation, but if you're not hanging them a lead, there's not much they can do for you. They're not going to be able to hit the ball. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a I mean, Parks, I guess. Pavin Parks can hit the ball, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but... I mean, Aaron uh, Altier was solid, but you expect that from him there. Yeah, I agreed. Um, Gold yeah, Farm. Again, the offense, some less... Hare, uh, Culver, Campos, Homer. Like, there were multiple... I didn't... My, my problem is not with the lineup. There were some holes. I think, you know, you could... The back end left something to be desired. But I remember, I... And I forget exactly the culprits on it, so that's on me, but watching a lot of Tri-City games this year, I really did notice a number of times they seemed to turn over. Uh, they weren't able to turn the lineup over. And so they either had the nine, you know, obviously like leading off the inning, or they weren't able to keep the inning going enough to have someone on base for the top end of the lineup again. It just, it seemed like it was just shooting them in the foot constantly. So uh, it could be in my head. It could, those things tend to stick out. I could actually look at the, the numbers and see, but it, it, you know, a little more of a complete lineup with less of a drop off might be nice. Um, other than that, you know, you got to just figure out the, the rotation. And I, it's, um, yeah, man, hard to find a good starter. It's just it so really hard. Felt, with, yeah, not analysis. I get that. But <laughs> it, yeah, at this point. Starting and, pitching is a premium. But like the overall, like, like just looking at Tri-City here, it felt like they were top heavy, right? Like you have two starters. The bullpen had some guys that were that was pretty deep. I'll give them that. But you look at the lineup and you're like one, two, three guys. And then once you get through those three, it's like okay, what else is here? And yeah, they had like seven and maybe eight if you want to call it with Walters playing most of the games. But they also have just like a lot of like forty guys, thirty eight, thirty seven, thirty seven, thirty six, thirty five, like guys that were playing chunks. But never really saw this. That kind of tells me that you always kind of had a 
roster in flux, right? When we just looked at New York, they had, what, 14 guys registered via baseball references taken at a bat? Mm -hmm. It's nearly double that here. So it's like, okay, we're doing a lot of work with this lineup here. And it's, there's a lot going on here. And I, I, I'm a big li- a roster consistency guy. Like I'm a big lineup consistency guy. I think there's enough anecdotal evidence, even if data doesn't back it, that like putting the same lineup out there every day is a good thing. Yeah. I think Tri City they had to tinker a lot. They, I think they had to tinker a lot. Yeah. You know, filling holes throughout the year, it wasn't necessarily by choice, but it was just a little too much to necessarily overcome with the guys they had. And then pitching wise, I mean, let me double check my numbers here. I feel like I mean they threw. A lot of different dudes. Uh, yeah. Again, could be in my head, but scroll, scroll, scroll. While you're scrolling, I mean, yeah, they threw 31 that. guys. I noticed just today, and, and talk about this one is, I know it's the other division, but Evansville sticks out to me as a team that we kind of were like, damn, this feels like a better than the sum of their parts type of thing. Mm-hmm. And Evansville, I'd have noticed today, I think threw 14 pitchers the entire year. Right? Crazy. Like, that's one pitching staff. That is a pitching staff, like zero turnover, essentially, numbers wise. So, God. um that kind of thing i think is underplayed a little bit is you know uh, obviously guys you give them more outings and it's tough because if you have a good team there's gonna be less turnover if you have less turnover you can say you might have a good team but it's chicken the egg but there's some sort of something to be said about you know the the churn going on it's it's usually a sign of something you know yeah i want just want to point out something unrelated it goes back to Richancy. I looked up the Travelers roster and I was like, okay, Christian Cologne's a manager now. He only retired in 21, wow. but he's a manager now. That's a fun thing. There you go. Yep. But fun fact, the hitting coach there, the name was familiar to me. So I was like, I got to look this up. For Patriot and Rockland Boulder fans, you'll remember the name, Michael hmm. Francosto. He's oh, the hitting cool. coach there. So. Love that. Yeah. I had to look it up, and I was like, "Oh, cool! He's there now. Yeah, he is in fact there now." Honestly, so I'm sorry. I want to revisit the pitching staff situation because it's it's starting to hit me just how bad it is. I mean, first of all, they had um, I I usually set my minimum at about 20 innings for the Frontier League to get yeah. discussed. They had 17 guys just throwing the bat limit, which is a lot. As I said, they had 31 throughout the year, but then you look at the distribution we've got i mean this is a ton they got seven guys i would consider like they really landed like what i call bad tier which is as low as i bother to go on you know with the scale here like they were just bottom they, they're bottom tier uh, in this and i'm not going to say who's who necessarily in this conversation but i'm saying got one who had 12 starts one with 15 starts one with 10 starts one with 15 starts one with 14 starts that is five starting pitchers, five of the eight that you used more than 10 times were bad. We're like, I mean, I can find it right now what percentage they were within the league. But, oh man, like they were outside of the top 60% of the league, I would say. Like that's not, oh no. Outside of the top seventy percent of the league, five of the eight starters they routinely used. Like that's just raw numbers wise. You can't have sixty six starts coming from guys who are outside the top seventy percent of starters. It just isn't feasible. But it's weird because Tri City feels like an organization that knows that. Yeah. It's. Uh, so I don't know what to do with that. I'll see. You wonder if something was going on behind the scenes, and that led to the managing change, and perhaps there'll be a different energy this year. But they do again. We oh, talk about the organization that wants to to win, which is. Oh, uh, trust me, the pitchers are going to have a different hole. Oh uh, yeah, um, they them run them poles, boys. Bring sneakers to practice. But change your PT clothes, boys. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then maybe that cardio would be good for him. Okay, we got playoff scenes we got to discuss. Let's talk about yes, Sussex sir. so that way we can we'll start there. to wrap this up. In any case, Sussex County. Uh, first year, Chris Wager. Looking at this team, honestly, it's a better team than I remember. Pitching wise, there's a lot of guys I really like. Batting yeah. wise, there's some really solid talent. You know? Like, 
there's not too much in the way yeah. of power, but there's guys mm-hmm. that are really, really solid. I mean, a guy like uh, Hipsman, 23. That's a solid year for a guy, 40, only 40 games, but still. Definitely. I mean, being above average over 40 games in the Frontier League in your first year is great. Bad 313. Got done. Um, yeah. Both great for what they did. And Mateo for 24 year olds. Those are all pretty good numbers. Mm-hmm. Stupinski was solid in what he was asked to do. Obviously, I'd like to see a little bit more overall on the whole lineup, but for what, about six guys, that's, that's a good six. Yeah, I agree. Um, trying to like, uh, you kind of nailed it on that one. Uh, those are guys that stood out to me. Uh, essentially, I liked Harris and kind of anybody that we consider above him. You know, Zierman, Hipsman, Stupanski, Mateo, Anu. That was kind of the, the core. Again, another one where six guys does not a lineup make. And that's yeah. sort of where they started to run into some issues when they had some teams that could actually pitch the ball. But you could also see they, they, they had a few games where they like really popped the Jackals. Uh, and yeah. unless, of course, the Jackals were thrown, you know, a certified G on the bump, in which case he shut them out and dropped a backflip on them. Yeah. So, like, that's how that'll go. Um, yeah, but legit, check. like, that is, uh, I mean, that's kind of how it goes, man. Like, yeah. they, when you have a, a lineup where five or six of the guys are, are a threat every time and three of them are, are just there. It's not going to work. Uh, you know, it will work enough to, to put up a solid record like they did, but it's just yeah. not going to be enough to, to do damage to the frontier. It turns into what they Pitching exactly staff, do. Though. It was a streaky, a streaky team, right? Like they need right. a streak to get in. And, yeah. you know, it, it's a live and die by situation, right? But meanwhile, you turn around and you look at the pitching staff and they have what? Three relievers, four relievers that are under two and a half. And if you extend yeah. it out a little bit more to under three, I mean, you got one hell of a stable there. And Mo Claire and Thornton are pretty good at the top there. Mike Reagan came on a little bit as a 23 year old. I mean, that's pretty good. So overall, I think there's a, there's something here, right? They're building, like, They're building for sure. Yeah. It's, this yeah. is definitely something there. Obviously, Robbie hits a guy. I don't know what his future is going to be at 27. Uh, Jimmy Boints is a guy that I think as a swing man was pretty solid in what he was asked to do. He's 26, though, so we'll see what happens there. But there's a lot of 23 year olds on this team that I really want to see what happens. Mainly Parsons, uh, Volcolo, and uh, Reagan are the three there. So, and that's where we get into what I was noticing. I feel like we've had this conversation now a few times in a row, and it's it seems to be a theme for the teams that are kind of middle of the road here. Yeah. Um, I, again, I got five guys. I mean, I would say, uh, Volcolo and Parsons were elite this year. Uh, Robbie hit a great year. Uh, Tyler, Andrew, Andrew, Jimmy Andrew. Boyce, v- very good. Um, Tyler Ledecky, Jimmy Boyce, very good this year. Uh, and then uh, Frasis Adamas average this year about. Yeah. But here's the problem. None of them had, it, all of them were primarily relievers. Yeah. Uh, that's your top six pitchers. Now, if we're going to get to the positive, we're looking at, you know, it's still Tyler Thornton, Mark Moclair, Mike Reagan, all of them were, you know, probably league average. Again, three league average starters, not a bad thing. If but you need your one and two, you need at least somebody better than average in that rotation, <laughs> which wasn't there. But it but the positive is uh Mike Reagan, uh, who Jose Ledesma, who we wasn't I, I wouldn't call him quite average, but he showed moments. I think he has potential in this league. Uh they're both 23, Griffin Baker, 25, uh, Jack Dellinger, who he, I was not overly impressed, but he did have some signs he might be able to compete. I really liked Alex Hart as a potential guy in this league. They're young still, too. Like There are some young pieces to this uh, potential rotation that I think could actually develop, and, and that's what you want to see for Sussex, like developing not just to compete in one year, but you know to start putting together a rotation that could actually challenge, you know, I was going to say yeah. the Jackals, but who knows where they're going to be now. But Quebec and you know some of the other teams are going to try City, depending on what they're bringing to the table. So I think that looks a lot better. I, I mean, I think they could bring the same exact team back and would probably be in the playoffs this year. But yeah. you know, that's not how the world works. That's not what this uh, conversation is. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've been curious to see what happens there. And I think with Sussex County, what really jumps out to me amongst them and a couple other teams we've discussed so far is really how important it is to get production from those young 23, 24 year old guys and time it up with those 26, 27, 28 year old guys. Cause right after that's really when it starts to put you into a crunch, 
right? So if you're going to get a career gear off a 27-year-old guy, you better hope that the rest of the lineup is right there. Because if they're not right there, then it's going to be really tough. And I feel like, and I was thinking about this earlier today, and it really come back to me now looking through it all, is especially on this level, you can't take any year for granted, right? Like any year in sport, you never know when you're going to get back there. But especially here with how volatile everything is and how young a lot of the guys are and then the age restrictions and roster classifications and everything that makes it just that much more difficult to build up, it really is tough to take any year for granted. Like a 55 win year is the light in the world on fire. No, but it gave yourself a chance. And like there's a lot of people associated with Celtics. I think they're going to look back on this year if, you know, let's say, 24 doesn't go their way or 25 doesn't go their way and think was that our real like shot for this five-year period was that our i lack of a better term window that we just did not capitalize on was that our one good shot of it which would be unfortunate but you know maybe i'm building it up too much but still it's something i think about it's like you really can't take it for granted on this level yeah i mean Yes, well said. I don't have much there. I mean, it's a tough challenge, and <laughs> I'm just again looking over the roster. I'm just I what got caught in my head there is like I was trying to think back through the number of last few years and like how many times this team, you know, Game could have competed. Short. Yeah, it would also like how many times the same team pro- would not have gotten stuck in maybe a one game playoff. It was just a different season. Yeah. But then again, it, it's always been stuck in one game playoff because Quebec's a nightmare. I don't know. Man. Yeah, that's it the sucks. thing. Like, you, it sucks. That's the <laughs> I problem. Mean, I was like, that's a good team. I'm like, they were a week behind Quebec, dude. I don't know. That's uh, the problem you have in the East that you don't have in the West, right? Because in the West, you're like, look, it's a one game. It's a best of five series. Who cares? You're not building your team to beat somebody in the East. You're building your team to get to the final. Mm-hmm. Anything can happen, right? In the East, it's like, you got to know, like, we're going to hit Quebec at some point. That's why, like, that last year, the Can-Am, that should have been, like, the boys now is the time. Go, 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 mm-hmm. go. Because they were down, and it's like, when Quebec has a down year, that's the time you got to strike. Because you're mm-hmm. going to, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. It's never easy. But Goliath is on the ground, man. Mm-hmm. Take your chance. This is the go for it year. But speaking of years where it's you look back and it's kind of wasted, New Jersey, which is the next spot, like yeah, boy, TJ built a very good roster, especially first year good in the Lord. Frontier League, very good I roster. Know. And you know the pitching struggled a bit. I think especially mm-hmm. early on it got better as the year went on, but early on it was tough. But that was a murderer's row of hitting, man. I mean, like. We, I have nine guys above league average just on this offense. It's crazy. I mean, they <laughs> generated so like half the league's power. I mean, between Forbes, Estrada, Barnum, Torrell, Jane, or Nelson, Marte, Rewald. I mean, like just between those guys alone, they generated like half the power in the league. Honestly, it was, I mean, what? They hit 13% of the league's home runs. <laughs> like, and they were that's and they, so like they were that's more than twice as many as if if it was just like randomly distributed all the home runs evenly across the teams they hit more than double that like that's absurd but uh, yeah it's I don't uh, hold on it's and it wasn't even just home runs they were getting on base too I know and look it's the ballpark I get it but like yeah. also not always like the only so we're talking about you know. The top three home run hitters in the league, right? Yeah. But only one of them is a, a lefty, like who's hitting to the direct short porch out there. So, you know, it, it's not that wild. I mean, oh my God, how many top? So five guys hit 20 home runs out of the 13 in the league who did it. Yeah. <laughs> gross. Uh, 30 yeah. home run guys so, in there too. In the summary, Jackal's right. offense, gross. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, yeah. I mean, James Nelson, what was that? I mean, I arguably know. one of the okay. most impressive years in the Frontier League. Um, I mean, Mike, 30 homers, 34 steals. Um, that's the season, buddy. That's a season. That's yeah. unreal. I, I then 
Keon Barnum obviously at 30 as well. Keon did it in eight less games, which is funny. But we saw him also. Boy, Keon can hit the ball. But oh, yeah. Uh, Grown yeah, man. I power. mean, the, the offense is almost a waste of time to go through because there, there's yeah. a. We've done. What are we going to say? Like, they were great. The park factors around the Jackals weren't that crazy. It, so, yeah, you can say it's the ballpark, but it's on the ballpark somewhat. And I, I would really lean into it for like maybe, you know, Josh Ray Waltz home run total a little bit. But, you know, that's not really the main point. The issue, you're right, was the pitching. But in the end, they also had about seven guys, call it, who were. You know, probably average to the average on the pitching staff, which is crazy because Matt Vogel just came out and like I've always been a Matt Vogel guy for a yeah, couple but of this years. This is now. crazy. This is something. Thirty six appearances. Yes. Thirty six appearances, four earned runs. Nasty. Twelve K per nine. Yeah, man. That's one that's an elite season in this league right now. Yeah. I mean, David LeBron also is very good. I like him a lot. Jorge Tavares, we saw him in person, just how nasty he can be when the time's right. Yeah. Oh. One last Luis note Taco of Vogel. Also came on. Yeah. He had, I was concerned about him, but he looked good. Yeah. One last note of Vogel, which is just kind of funny for me, is you look at his ERA in New Jersey, it's sub one. Then in Long Island, because he only got in a third of an inning and he gave five earned, he's got a 135 ERA. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go I back. People, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, nah, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. And the same thing happened in 2018 with New Jersey, where he had three uh, 14 ERA, only pitched 14 innings or whatever. Goes to York. A third of an inning, he gives up four earned for 108 ERA. So it happened to him twice. Like, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny Baseball how it worked sucks. out. Yeah. We're hitting oh, we like a kettle ear. six walks. Insane. What are you so, I, 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 what I'll say, and, and I, I've mentioned before, I mean, I'm, I'm friendly enough with PJ, but like I yeah. never was really blown away by PJ's ability to pick people up mid season. He was a very good yeah. preseason roster builder and very offensive minded. And I was yeah. genuinely really impressed that he was able to add so many solid pitchers mm. from you know, mid season. It just seemed like two different things that were not his main strength. But then you remember he was out there for the first four years, like putting teams together in the Pacific association. So I guess it kind of tracks, Yeah, but I mean, it was just, it was, the kind of thing that just got exposed. It was just, it was too much. Quebec is too much to put together a, a, a found parts type of pitching staff plus a couple stars and, and exactly. get it done against them for multiple games in a row. And then it's also too much to just try to mash through. Like we saw it in a playoff series. I mean, they, they did have moments where it was like, Oh, this offense is electric, but then you just hit yeah. a hot pitcher and that's it. And, and I mean, Speaking as a Phillies fan, I know how that goes. Like yeah. hitting is the one thing. Like pitching is always going to be nasty. Like let's be honest. But it's if you got a big game guy on the bump, it's going to probably work out well. But if you got a bunch of great hitters, you they still have to solve the riddle of whoever's out there. And it, some days they just don't. And then especially for power hitters relying on power, and now you're leaving a ballpark that you were kind of built and comfortable in. Like yeah, man, it's going to get a little tough. And we yeah. saw that. Plus having to switch. At the very end of the year, to go and out play home games and mm-hmm. Skylands doesn't help you either. Yeah. And I mean, we saw even in game one, I mean, the rain undoubtedly helped them, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if not for the rain, that game doesn't get washed out. I mean, they needed what was it about an inning more for it to count as an official game. Mm-hmm. And if that was the case, then you know, maybe that doesn't go as many games as it did, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe it doesn't go, uh the full length. Maybe it ends in two. Yeah. Yeah, It's just so hard hard to be back like that. Exactly. And it's just one of those things where it's like, it's not an indictment on New Jersey. It's really just, Quebec is that good. They're just that hard Mm -hmm. to beat. And yeah, and you're going to need, I I truly believe for a playoff run, you just need at least one or two servers who are just going to be dogs yeah. and they had one, but like they couldn't get him out there. Now. I mean, they threw him every opportunity they could. I mean, he legit, I was asking about, it. I was like, Hey dude, like you're, you're throwing him a lot, dude. Because remember he threw, I think a complete game. They came back out the next game in relief. You know, you yeah. should have other guys that you can trust in situation other than guy with arm taped on. Uh, it's just not what you want to see. And that's not a criticism necessarily. It's just, 
it, it we knew it was going to be hard to recruit pitching in that ballpark. So you were only going to get a couple of top line guys. Jorge Tavares was fantastic. He was the kind of guy who wanted the ball in his hand. I love that. You shouldn't have to put the ball in his hand. That's it. I mean, that's how it goes. But that's what you got. Well, that being said, we got one mm-hmm. team left. To wrap this thing. Yeah. So they are very good. Anyway, thank you for listening. I was going to say, anyone that doesn't want to hear us just, you know, do our usual thing. I want to keep it back. short. I want to keep it short because honestly, like, I know we're going to talk about it and we're going to talk about a lot of the same roster again next year. And that's going to be in like a month. So, I'm like, well, yeah. fair. But just heads up, it's going to be all positive from here. So, if you don't want to hear that about Quebec again, see you next week. So, Quebec. TJ White's really good. Justin Gideon's really yep. good. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of guys on this team that are really good. Ruben Castro, Lebro. solid. Lebro was my my standout guy, man. I was oh, really yeah. impressed. Mark That's Antoine, year old dude. Mark yeah. Antoine, Lebro. Oh God, the French is so phenomenal. Kyle Kroll, solid man, dude. Big Kyle Kroll guy. Ruben Castro, obviously. I mean, dude, it's just a good lineup. And and here's the thing, like I don't think, and this is the the thing about Quebec that I make I think makes them so nasty is it is not. So again, I throw them on my like hundred is average scale. Yeah, they are not a team, and they might be the only playoff team that did not have a guy like over a one fifty, even a one forty. But they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dudes in that lineup who all hit. Basically together, well, six band right. there, who were like above like a one fifteen if a hundred is average. Like they have so many consistently average guys, and the rest of the lineup was right at league average. So like there were no it's holes in that lineup, and it's just it punch is it's just punch death after man. punch. It just they keep coming, and we and talked a lot about it. its complete roster uh, construction, and, and it just is, and it seems you know. It, they are an organization that does think far, pretty far ahead. They seem to have a at least a two-year plan at any given time, uh, and they're making sure they don't get kind of caught their pants down with guys that are uh, running into roster classification dead ends. And, and this seems to be the result. I mean, it's a team where Jeremy Profar is like not even a headliner on this roster, which is funny. But like it, it, they combine that again. We're talking like consistent depth with. So across the board, they were able to put about nine league average to very good guys in the lineup. And then on the pitching side, they had two guys who were well above league average pitching wise. Another who was no, Harley Gollert. So I mean, uh, Abdiel Saldana, uh, Stephen Fuentes, yeah, Saldana, Harley Saldana. Gollert, all up there, like very notably very good. Um, they ran out with Ruben Ramirez and Ryan Sandberg. Who I, I, neither of them blew me away. But young guys, twenty four, and they held their own as like four or five starters. Mm. Um, and then, and, and when we're looking at four and five starters on other teams, we're typically seeing a, fi- a ERA string with a five or even a six. Both those guys kept it down below five. Hell, Ruben Ramirez went um, went nine and two. So they're obviously keeping the team in games, and that's just it. Because you also have the bullpen, who is just you know Evan Rutchik, uh, Frank Muscatiello. Uh, Kenny Pearson, Elliot Carney. I mean, that's enough yeah. to really, and Kyle Mott, sorry, I don't want to leave you out. You were yeah. hanging on right there on the edge of that list. But like, I mean, that's a complete team. That's five solid relievers to go to, including two top line relievers. Evan was probably elite. I mean, when he was with yeah. them for 22 innings, it, it's just, it's so, there's so few holes that you have to, it's that you not only have to exploit one, like it, there's a lot of these teams where if you get to their starter, you got them. This yeah. on the Quebec team, you have to get to the starter, you have to work through the relievers, and you have to keep the offense quiet. Like, you have to check multiple boxes to get a Quebec win on any given night. It's just a headache, man. It's, it I know we talk about them a lot, but they are seemingly so far ahead on just the uh, the fullness of the roster construction. That's it's just notable, it's a, it's noticeable when you look at it. That's the thing they got to see. Like, earlier I mentioned, like, to really win, you need one or two stars that's gonna stand out. Quebec, I guess you could argue in a sense they have one or two guys that stand out and can step up. But like you said, it's the depth. It's the fact that it just keeps coming and coming and coming. And in every other lineup, you have at least a break in it. You know, as a pitcher, you go, okay, if I could just get to the first five guys, it's going to get easier. Or if I could just get to the first six guys, I'm going to have my shot at it. You know, I'm still going to beat them more often than not. But with Quebec, it's like, there really isn't a break in it. (laughs) You know, 
there are seven, eight guys, like a lot of teams, six, seven. So it's like, okay, it doesn't get easier. And then, like you said, with the pitching wise, it's like, again, there's two or three guys that are like, okay, solid. But nobody do you look and go, all right, this is our day. You have to play a complete game every single time you play them. And it's really, really hard to play a completely disciplined game at the plate to not make mistakes on the mound. It's really hard because you know they're going to jump you if you give them a mistake. And like we saw them this year, they start off slow. We're like, oh, what's wrong with them? And then like it hit June and they're like, oh, right, end of June. Yeah, we got to start trying now. And then next eight weeks was just a torrent pace. Well, yeah, and it's tough to be consistent. Like uh, it's a be consistent and not make mistakes, but it's even harder to do that when you have a frontier league roster. It's yeah. nothing against frontier league, but the frontier league roster is going to force you to have young guys in there. And yeah. it forces you to have guys at, at veteran status who probably have other options if they wanted to. So they either have to choose to be with you or they're who's available a lot of the time. And to get that roster together and solid and bought in and together and disciplined enough to not make the mistakes that cost you games against a team as well built. It's just a lot, man. I mean, you look at their top five hitters, at least sort of in my eyes, we're looking at 24-year-old, 25-year-old, 26, 24, 28. That is, I mean, and you can see how it's staggered too. Like yeah. you got young guns, but you also got guys like they are not running into roster restrictions all at once, Yeah, yeah thank which you. we've seen on some of the other teams that we're looking through. That's the thing. Like other guys, like we talked about New Jersey, yeah, well, there are different reasons why, but like Sussex mm-hmm. where it's like, okay, they have their half the teams that are or half the roster is okay this is our last shot at and the other half are like okay we're coming up yep. and so it's that wave Quebec future proofs their roster <laughs> they're like okay right. this is the last year for these five we're gonna have to move them out we're gonna have to get something back for them and then I mean, it's like, top, yeah yeah they, I mean their top five pitchers as well I mean are 26 to 31 however their next one two three four, five, six, seven, three of which I would call average to above average already are all 25 and under, mostly 24. Yeah. What makes them sound like, <laughs> like they're a machine? They're a machine because they run so yeah. methodically where it's like, mm-hmm. okay, this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and everything's planned out. It's all how it should be. And the fact is, like, you expect teams, as the season goes on, through attrition, you're going to lose guys, right? Right, through getting picked up, through injury, through them just not performing for however long, whatever it may be. They don't. They just don't. Like, yeah, they had the slow start, but hey, then they came on for eight, ten weeks straight. So I was like, okay, they had a bad May and a slow June. Who cares? July and August, they were untouchable. So they survived a rough stretch. Every team has a rough stretch. Not every team has the hot streak they had. And, like, the thing is, you can't point them and be like, oh, well, they had it easy. Like, where did they have it easy? They played a more complete conference slate. They, sure, they had the bye, but they earned their bye. And then they got, what would you say, the second best or third best team in the league in the playoff round? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Sorry, I had to think it through. Yeah, so I, I wasn't. Mean, like, I, was, I was ready to do a full rank game ahead there, but yeah, I got there. Yeah, so I mean, like, you look at it through. They didn't get it easy. At no point was it easy for them, and they just kept fighting back. And they were winning games in different ways too, right? Sometimes they'd blow you out. Sometimes they'd walk you off. Sometimes they just, you know, just win normal. That's what makes them dangerous: is the fact that they're just kind of a machine. <laughs> You have an expectation, they show up and they meet it. And that's why, like, going through it, I guess I'll just quickly do it the clean way. We're like, exceed expectations for Empire State, New Jersey, and Sussex County. I didn't buy into New Jersey much in the preseason because I doubted the pitching. Yeah, but same. It, they Which all, is right. I mean, it was not necessarily the same pitching staff. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, they all exceeded the expectations I had for them. And then Met was, you know, New York. Three Rivers in Quebec because Quebec has such a high expectation, high standard. Like, yeah, I expect them to win about 60 games and win a championship. And when, like, achieving the highest level you can in your league is your expectation, you know, how do you, how do you excel past that? 
by becoming inevitable. Which is kind of what they have been, really. Yep. And for observant listeners at home, yes, I had Ottawa and Tri-City as the failed to meet. We went over why Ottawa, as far as uh, Tri-City went, I kind of felt like, okay, they need to make the postseason. I expect them to make the postseason, and they didn't do that. So, For Tri-City? Yeah. Oh. Huh. Hmm. Coming into the year, I felt like they really needed to do that, right? Like, they fell short quite literally on the last two or three days of the season the past two years i was like they're knocking on the door they have pete here they got some good pieces they need this i'm sorry and, I, I put trois rivier in my head we were okay. on the canada vibe that's me that's on me though i would yeah. also say they didn't meet expectations so yeah is what it is. yeah let's wrap yeah. this thing huh so uh you want to do some plugs and then we can get out of here yeah man indie ball nation youtube twitter instagram and uh yeah it's about what i got going on Dropped a video last week just talking about who's in MLB from the uh, indie ball ranks for the most part. Got that looks like about 90% of the coverage, right? So, hey, how about that? Missed a couple of randoms who slipped through on the last roster update. I'm like, damn you, but I was gonna redo the video. So, there you go. Yeah, also, I love the on your Instagram. Video. Sorry, technically speaking, Shut very sound video. The lighting, French kiss, but <laughs> Shut up. Uh, uh, go ahead. It doesn't compare at all to my YouTube content, I know, but that's that's neither here nor there. Uh, yeah, so any ball pod on Twitter, any ball for whatever else. I will say, if you've been listening on Google Podcasts, uh, they've discontinued that Google. That is, you can still export it, and I'm pretty sure you're still getting podcasts for now. But they are going to cut servers off for good in the next few weeks. So find another platform. You can listen on Spotify, Amazon Music, Podbean, if you want to just go directly to where we upload it to and not go through on the other ones, Apple Podcasts too. I mean, like all the major ones, you know, we're on them. So just as a heads up, make sure you get on another one so you don't, you know, one day go, why aren't they uploading anymore? Well, we are. It's just, you know, hey. Also, expect a Chicago update next week. Had a very, Mm -hmm. very informative conversation this past week with, how am I going to describe it to protect them? Ah, sure. let's, let's call a former team, former person, a person formerly employed by the team. We'll call it like that. Go. We'll go with that. That's pretty vague. <laughs> so. There have been a lot of those. Exactly. More and more, as it would appear. So that's what it is. Uh, it was a very long, hour and a half long phone call. So. So if you out for a sports business journal article probably coming soon about how great it is to work in Chicago. Absolutely. So on that note, we have nothing else left to add. Until next time, don't forget to play ball. <laughs>